CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. The April 4th, 2024 public meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in a remote format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, which extended remote participation in public meetings until March 31st of 2025. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. All meeting materials are available at the link I'm putting in the chat now. And as folks are still joining, I will very likely enter that again when everybody is in the room so that they have access to the same materials. In fact, I'm going to wait for a couple of people to join now. There's the link. Chuck Taroni is our commission chair. He'll facilitate this meeting. And please note that there will be a public comment period for each hearing. Each vote taken during the meeting will be conducted via roll call vote. And we start with roll call attendance. So Chuck, to you. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, let's start uh, roll call attendance with Mike Gildesgame. Present. Nathaniel Stevens. Present. Brian McBride. Present. Susan Chapnick. Present. David White. I'm here. David Kaplan. Here. And Chuck Taroni's here. Um, also, we have associate members Eileen Coleman. Here. Thanks. Um, and Sarah Alfaro Franco. Uh, present. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to quickly review the agenda before we get started. Uh, we'll start out with uh, administrative um, and review the minutes and then go on to the correspondence and discussion items involve a scout project. And we're going to take that scout project out of order because we're just going to wait until Ben Gregory gets here. He has a, um, it's first on our list, but we'll do that when he gets in. We'll have a water bodies group discussion and appoint an appointment. Um, tree committee update, if there's one. Artificial turf committee update, if there's one. And then we'll go on to the Arlington High School permit extension. And then two certificates of compliance for 47 Spy Pond Lane and 19 Sheridan Park. Request for determination 36 Peabody and 88 Coolidge. I believe this has been continued, but we'll get to that. Um, so if anyone's here for 88 Coolidge, that's going to be continued when we get to that spot in the agenda tonight. And then lastly, we'll take on the notice of intent for Thorndike Park. And with that, we'll quickly go back to David, but what he's going to do is put up the minutes for review. David, I yeah. sent some edits really late. I have them. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, sorry, a few more people coming in. Admit them before we move on. Great. All right. So there were a few minor edits. Put the date of footer. Um, a clarification about enforcement order that Nathaniel added here. Some reordering. Clarification about additional work, 51 Grove Street. It's a pretty light touch. Otherwise, there are a few things toward the end here of each hearing where looks like it was Nathaniel added to each uh, motion that the applicant consented to have the hearing continued. Also a note here about Herbert Miller Brook and sort of status. It's misspelled, I think. It's, I think it's M Y E R. Yeah, that's what I thought too. I wasn't sure. Thanks. Yeah. 
that happened. Chase Bernier's affiliation as WCA. Let's throw like place materials here. And likewise, as noted, Nathaniel's additions. Sorry, David, can you go back up to the top? The um, Dudley, the enforcement for Dudley Street appeared twice. So I just wanted to make sure that, that what I did was correct. I deleted the second discussion of it. It looked like it was left over from prior minutes or something. I think that's the case. So I was trying to put the, the dates it together. Yeah. Right. It looked right. No. I, I was, I was, um, did you check if Brian McBride actually voted for that though? Because he came at 8.04 and I wasn't sure when we did. I, I don't have my notes with me, my notebook. Um, remote, remote, I'm in Florida. Um, so could you just check um, that Brian was there for the vote of the, of the enforcement order? I'm not sure he was. I don't know if he remembers. Do you remember Brian? Sorry, I'd have to I'd have to read it. Right, so maybe you can just check the recording because I think he maybe was not. I will check the recording, no problem. Great. Thanks, David. Give me a call if you have any questions or can't figure it out. Will do. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes with these edits. In a second. I'll second. Great. Um, roll call vote. Brian McBride? Approved, yes. Agreed. Susan Chapnick? Yes. David Kaplan? Yes. David White? Yes. Mike Gildisgame? Yes. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, so that takes care of the minutes from March 7th, 2024. We'll move on to uh, just a note that all correspondence that we received uh, between March 21st and April 26th is available for public uh, for public to review. Uh, and you want to um, contact the conservation agent um, at the office. And David Morgan can put in a link to contact himself um, for any of those minutes. Or oh, sorry, for any of those comments. Uh, Discussion item, first thing on the agenda is that Eagle Scout project, but I don't think uh, Ben Gregory's here. I don't see him at least. Okay, so we're gonna move on to David White with his Water Bodies Working Group um, discussion. Okay, we requested for the next fiscal year, $120,000. The FinCom approved $85,000. So it's below what we asked for. So we have to think about how to economize in the work that we do. So that's a sort of a negative impact. But anyway, it's, um, it's what it is. Mm. So work with that. I'd also like to recommend Eileen Coleman for the Water Parties Working Group. Oh, there's Eileen right there. Um, I'm not sure. Does this need a vote, or is that just a uh, a recommendation? We should prove it some way. Maybe a vote. Okay. Uh, so, does so someone want to make a motion? I just so move. So moved. Second. Second. So we have a motion moved. Have Eileen Coleman um, become part of the Water Bodies Working Group. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Enthusiastically, yes. <laughs> David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes, definitely. Okay. And uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Yes, also enthusiastically and with great gratitude for serving. <laughs> Thanks, Eileen. Okay, and Chuck Taroni says yes. Great. All right. Sounds like you have found yourself a home. All right. Um, and David, um, just before you go on, um, David and, and Water Bodies Working Group, I, when is the next meeting? And and I hope on the agenda, one of the agenda. Thursday. It's this Thursday? Next Thursday. Thursday. Next Thursday at 6? Six? Six, yes. Okay, great. We're and, your time. and you'll send out an agenda. Thank you, David. Yeah. Yeah. And also my note that the we're going to get a new aerator replacement for Hills Pond. 
Great. That's uh, everybody was been waiting around for that to 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 get replaced. Okay, so the next on my list is um, a uh, update for the water uh, for the tree committee from Sarah. Uh, Sarah, Alfredo Franco, are you there? You are. You have an update for us today. I actually uh, provided a. Um, a summary at the last meeting. I will be happy to repeat it, uh, but um, I mentioned that there were going to be 150 trees planted this spring season, and uh, the schedule was a month and a half ahead of schedule uh, because of the weather. Uh, I can go back to my notes and certainly do it. Uh, restate it. Well, there's, there's no new meeting. I think we covered. Mm. Okay. All right. Good. Well, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Well, all <laughs> thank right. You. Thank, thank you for that brief update. Uh, so now we're going to move on to uh, Mike Gildas came with the artificial turf update. And uh, if Mike could also let us know when the next meeting is for the artificial turf committee, that would be great. Yeah. The next meeting, uh, which probably the final meeting will be the 9th of April and um, which is Tuesday. Uh, the Artificial Turf Study Committee is concluding its work, and uh, we have, uh, as went out with information about this meeting, uh, there was a draft of report came, that came out, and um, uh, that report will be finalized with final edits uh, shortly. Um, the uh, the chair, Jim DeTulio, and the clerk, Natasha Waden, have been working diligently to upgrade, update uh, the uh, report, which uh, will be issued shortly. I don't know the exact timing on that, but it will be done soon. May I just add that there is a draft report posted to the Artificial Turf Study Committee webpage. If anybody wants to get a preview of what the draft is, but it will be updated as Mike said. Correct. Thank you, Susan. Great. Okay. So moving right along, we have um, actually the town and the school committee. Uh, well, the town and the school is here. And so Jeff Thielman um, is going to be speaking soon. And uh, so the Arlington High School permit extension, DEP file number 91-323 is here for an extension. Jeff Thiemann, please introduce yourself for the record and your team and bring us up to date with your project. And I think you what you'd also want to do is just let us know who's with you that needs to be, uh, you know, unmuted and, and whatnot, or at least they can turn their camera on and unmute themselves. Okay, thanks. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna share a, a PowerPoint so that we guide the conversation and stay uh, on task here. So let's see if we can get that up first. Yeah. So I need screen sharing privileges. I'm Kiersey Allison Ampe. I'm on there. Sure, Jeff. I wasn't sure if you uh, <laughs> just stated your name uh, yeah, for the record. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Also. Okay. So can you hear me, Chuck? I can maybe that I so, so I see so many people in that screenshot there. Everybody should just you know for the record introduce themselves. Okay, sir. Sure. Okay, so my name is Jeff Thielman. I'm the chairperson of the Arlington High School Building Committee. I'm Kiersey Allison Ampe. I'm current chair of the school committee and a member of the Arlington Building Committee. Good evening, everyone. Jim Feeney, town manager. Hi, everyone. Liz Holman, superintendent. Um, hello, everybody. My name is John Amato, and I'm with JJ Sports, the sports field designer. Steve Garvin, professional engineer from Samios Consultants, civil engineer. Lori Coles with HMFH Architects, the architect for your high school. Arthur Duffy, uh, also with HMFH, uh, architect for the high school. Jim Burroughs with Skanska, serving as OPM for the high school project. Matthew Janker, Janker Arlington High School principal. Okay, right. so um, we're going to kind of use this uh, to guide our conversation so we stay uh, on task here. As, as uh, I just said, my name is Jeff Thielman, and I chair the Arlington High School Building Committee, which, as you know, is requesting an extension of the order of conditions this commission 
originally granted in 2020 for the synthetic turf fields at the new Arlington High School, which you see on the screen. The presenters uh, today, the four presenters will be myself and our co-vice chairs, uh, Superintendent Dr. Elizabeth Homan and our town manager, Jim Feeney, and Dr. Kersey Allison Ampey, who's a member of the building committee and the uh, school committee. And other representatives in, in the room are here to answer your questions. We're here today to follow up on the specific research the commission asked us to perform after the meeting we had together in August of 2003. When I spoke to uh, Mr. Taroni, we agreed it would be helpful to begin with background information about the high school project. So the building committee <clears throat> and the conservation commission have a shared interest in protecting Millbrook, which runs underneath the fields of our high school. From the beginning of the project, the committee's goal, the building committee's goal has been to build a lead platinum facility and we have worked carefully to ensure the site's landscaping protects the town's waterways, wildlife, and vegetation. In planning for the use of 174,000 square feet of fields under our jurisdiction, we carefully considered the school's needs and the need to protect Mill Brook. Since 2016, the town has worked in partnership with the Massachusetts School Building Authority to construct our new high school, which has four phases two of which are completed and two of which are underway. Phase three, the construction of the athletics wing is scheduled for completion in February of 2025 and work on phase four, including preparation of the fields and the connection of the bikeway has also begun. During early community discussions and right up through the 2019 voter approval of the project, synthetic turf fields have always been proposed for the new school. As mentioned in the report we submitted to you on March 20th, 2024, to remain on schedule and on budget, the project needs to order the infill for the synthetic fields by June 30th, 2024, less than 90 days from today. In the summer of 2020, the Conservation Commission met several times to review plans for the turf fields, which we explained were planned for construction in 2024. The commission reviewed supporting documents, studied the drainage system that protects Mill Brook from crumb rubber inflow, and concluded the fields as designed did not have a significant or cumulative effect upon the wetland values protected by the bylaw. Per the approved order of conditions by the commission, the scope and plans for the fields were detailed in the agreement the town signed with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. In 2021, the town signed seven contracts for work to be performed in the fields. We locked in prices at rates in place at that time. And by 2023, we had already built some of the systems supporting the fields. In July of 2023, the Arlington High School Building Committee applied for an extension of the 2020 order of conditions. During the meeting, the Conservation, Conservation Commission was told about new information pertaining to six PPD and six PPD quinone. When this information was given to the building committee at the August 2023 hearing, we agreed that we would evaluate the costs, risks, and benefits of crumb rubber and alternative infills and study the applicability of the cited research to the specific conditions on the fields of Arlington High School. The commission then granted a one-year extension of the 2020 order of conditions. I'll now turn to my colleagues who will summarize our findings over the past eight months. All right, I'm gonna get us started. Hi everybody, once again, I'm Liz Homan. I'm the superintendent of schools. Um, I wanna start by noting that there are pretty significant limitations to any additional changes that would be made to the design in this late stage in the project that wouldn't have a really significant impact on the budget and the schedule. So what you see on this slide um, is that budgetary impact um, and the financial implications are listed there as additional costs uh, over the baseline budget of the, the building project, uh, which would need to come out of contingency. And you can see a number of the alternative options here, as well as what we know about the durability of these products and the athletic impact of different products. And I wanna highlight just a few points about those. First is why we initially chose turf fields. Um, we know that the synthetic turf fields provides a better performance uh, environment for our student athletes. It provides for longer seasons, which gives for more playing time. 
Um, and that's because there's more manageable maintenance of this product and it's upkeep through free cycles and wet weather conditions is stronger. And we also know that because of that, there are safety considerations attached to the alternatives um, because they can provide for slicker conditions. Uh, they can freeze during freeze cycles, which can also um, have an impact on the ability to play on the fields uh, or on the maintenance of the fields. And we also have the ability to mitigate the environmental impact through the design of the system, um, which I know my colleagues will talk about a little further in a moment. Uh, this summary table provides the infill alternatives that we have evaluated. The alternatives to crumb rubber introduce significant additional costs to the project, as I pointed out, and also have drawbacks, um, including lower athletic performance. We called athletic directors at Minuteman and Watertown, which have alternatives um, in their turf fields. And they cited less traction, less forgiving surfaces, um, that those surfaces could be harder on uniforms, on skin, they were more abrasive to the athletes and that the athletes and athletic directors uh, at those schools preferred crumb to the synthetic uh, surfaces that they were currently using. We also have less data just due to time and less usage on the impact of some of the lower traction surfaces, um, alternative surfaces. And what that raises for me, myself, and Dr. Jenger, who are tasked with making sure that our students are safe is we're concerned about additional injuries, the potential for additional injuries and the research on concussions in athletics and the long-term impacts that that can have on student athletes um, as they move into adulthood is really significant. And so I wanna underscore uh, that particular concern for me as an educator, because it is one that um, I know I think about a lot when our students are going out onto the field. We want more playing time. It's good for our student athletes to have as much time in their extracurriculars as possible. And we are um, directly responsible for ensuring their health and safety. Next slide. So, so yeah, so uh, in conclusion, for a few reasons, um, the crumb rubber is the best option for Arlington High School right now. We have proven data um, and there have been many successful installations that mitigate the environmental impact of crumb rubber. We know that it has superior athletic performance and better safety conditions for our student athletes, that the project product longevity ensures safe conditions for an extended period of time compared to their alternatives, and that ex extended playing time through all seasons is gonna allow for more of the benefits for students of athletic engagement. That total benefit compared to natural grass is the equivalent of adding four fields to the town and all of the alternatives we evaluated have the potential to re reduce that positive impact to some extent. And so for all of those reasons, uh, most paramount for me of which is safe playing conditions, from rubber is the best option for Arlington High School right now. And as time goes on and more research is conducted on alternatives, we might be able to evaluate alternative fill materials um, in future cycles. So I'm curious, Allison Ampey, and at this point we'd like to move on to the fish toxicity concerns. In August of 2023, uh, in the concerns were raised in July and August of 2023. At these meetings, an abstract was cited about a study showing the negative impact of 6-PPD quinone on coho salmon. Since these meetings, the AHSBC and its consultants have reviewed multiple studies, and our conclusion is that the conditions needed to create 6-PPD quinone are not present in the AHS field design. So first I'd like to review 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone. 6-PPD is used to, in rubber tires to stabilize them against UV light. The combination of smog, including nitrox, nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds and UV light from sunlight act upon the 6-PPD and form 6-PPD quinone. This occurs in tiny particles of tire called tire abrade. In heavy rain, tire braid is washed off of the highways and into ecosystems. The 6-PPD quinone in runoff has been found to kill fish. Additional studies have shown, found that most of the 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone remains in particle form. Biofilters of, composed of leaf mold, sand, and crushed stones have been shown to protect the fish from highway runoff. In this slide, which is ugly, I'm sorry, um, I'm trying to show that tire braid is not the same thing as crumb rubber. On the left side of the slide, you can see where I've tried to do a size comparison. The top part is tire braid. The smallest particle of tire braid is one micron, which you can't see uh, at the scale that I had to make the slide. Uh, for comparison, a hundred micron circle is drawn, and then the largest 
higher grade particle is 1,000 microns. In comparison, the rubber infill sizes are below in gray. And you can see they range from 1,000 micron to 2,360 microns. Um, and so they are much, much larger. Um, for an actual size comparison, if you take that largest part rubber particle, the 22,360 micron one, that's about the size of a lowercase o as printed in the text of our memo that we sent you. So looking at composition, the compositions are also very, very different. Composition of tire braid, it's actually a heterogeneous composition of rubber from tires, mineral particles from the road, and dust from other traffic re wear related particles such as brakes. Metals found include magnesium, iron, copper, zinc, titanium, molybdenum, magnesium, barium, um, tin, and I forget what SB and chromium, lithium, iridium, and I forget the other ones. They're not very common. Lead. Lead. PBS lead. Yeah, PBS yeah. lead. Yeah. Lead. It's good periodic. Sorry, table I didn't write them all down. I didn't think I was going to read them all. Um, mm. It's been a long time since we had him. Okay, so composition rubber infill instead, or the rubber infill that would be for the field. It's sourced from domestic tires. It doesn't include SUV tires or truck tires. It's washed, it's free from dust. There's no metals or metal cords. It's independently compliance tested for both extractable heavy metals and PFAs. And it meets the standard consumer safety spec specifications for toy safety. So this is a diagram I've created to try and compare the production conditions for 6PB quinone. On the left is in the road. So in the road, you have cars, which create tiny part, minute road abrade particles. You get UV light from the sun, ozone from the smog, and that creates conditions that produce the 6PBD quinone. Instead, on the field, we don't allow cars. We don't have smog. Um, there's less UV light because the particles are shaded by carpet fiber and the, the rubber particles are larger. And these do not fulfill conditions to produce 6 PBD quinone. From there, I'd like to move on to the drainage plan because this also impacts the system. This diagram is what you find in the memo. In the next slide, I've begun stepping through it so that I can show you how the different components filter uh, any runoff that comes from the field. Um, the filtration, first I want to note that the filtration steps are highlighted in green. Step one shows the start of the drainage and filtration. Water falls onto the field and is filtered through a three inch, three quarter inch layer of sand before it seeps into the shock pad. Step two shows how the uh, water flows through channels in the shock pad directly, direct that direct flow into the trench drain that surrounds the fields. Step three is where the trench drains flow into the trench drain basins. These basins have potentially two filtration steps. The first is the sump, which is the standard industry standard. And that's where the heavier rubber infill settles to the bottom of the basin while, uh, while the water flows out. The second part is an optional trench drain filter basement, which we see as a betterment for the system, but is optional. Step four is another filtration step. The water flows through subsurface piping to drain inlet basins, which contain another sump. Step five has a final filtration step. The water is delivered through a series of wide, shallow chambers, which are filled with crushed stone, causing the water to flow to slow and any particles to be captured. Step six shows the water flowing to an on-site collection system, and then clean water is released to Millbrook. And next we have our financial information. Sure. Hello again, everyone. Uh, Jim Feeney here. I sit on the finance subcommittee for the uh, building project. As many of you know, as uh, residents, voters, and taxpayers, this project is funded by the 2019 debt exclusion vote, which provides uh, funding from Arlington's taxpayers, and that is combined with funding from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to make this project a reality. 
So at the beginning of the project, we entered into a project funding agreement uh, with the MSBA. And once that is set, the town is obligated to stay within that project budget and has very limited options for moving outside of that approved budget. Uh, you know, meaning that the town cannot simply, it's not a simple task for the town to add more funds after the project has begun. Because of this specific project funding agreement signed with the MSBA, the MSBA would have sole discretion to determine whether any additional funding added to the project is considered eligible. And what that impacts is if the funding is deemed ineligible by the MSBA, it would then proportionally decrease the town's maximum total facilities grant portion. So the town has the potential to lose additional project reimbursement funds by infusing new funds. So as we've talked about before and as is displayed here, any changes to the, the scope of the project would need to be funded through the use of contingency funds and require a vote of the Arlington High School Building Committee. To date, the total committed costs of the turf fields component of the project are just over $1.2 million. Uh, as uh, Mr. Thielman noted previously, the High School Building Committee has already awarded seven subcontracts related to this turf field, and any material changes in the plans for the fields will cause the locked-in subcontract values to increase to today's 2024 costs which will necessarily reflect multiple years of high inflation as compared to 2020 prices. Additionally, if a contract were to be canceled, a subcontractor has a likely case to bring a claim against the project and the town for lost revenue. I will note that uh, site work completed to date includes uh, bringing both the permavoid and anchor trench systems to the site, and they are currently stored on site. So uh, obviously at the August uh, meeting of the Conservation Commission last year, you asked if we could use contingency funds for an alternative infill. The uh, high school building committee did take up that uh, decision, and they did not believe there are enough funds in contingency at this particular point in the project to purchase an alternative turf infill. And as Dr. Holman noted, even if sufficient <laughs> funds were in fact available, the committee, the school district's leadership and the project design team did not believe it was in the best interests of our students to purchase an alternative infill. So with respect to the contingency, obviously it is comprised of both a construction and soft cost contingency totaling just over $9.3 million. Uh, to date, or in fact, at the time we published this table, we had already used 72% of our contingency and therefore have a remaining amount of approximately $2.6 million. Uh, and that is with, you know, approximately or upwards of 20 months of construction remaining. So we have used contingency funds for several unforeseen expenses already, and we've discussed a few potential uses of remaining contingency funds with respect to the project. I will note the project is entering a phase of construction with significantly higher risks. Due to existing known site contamination, including hexavalent chromium, the high school building committee needs to ensure a healthy amount of contingency funds are available in case future issues arise in that area of the project as we approach the, uh, the barrier, the handling of soils, potentially contaminated groundwater, there are a number of things that could create large swings in contingency fund usage. So the, the final thing I will note is that if we were to finish this project under budget and with any project funds remaining, that would result in us uh, borrowing less total dollars and accruing less total interest, meaning uh, less tax burden on Arlington's residents. So for those reasons, the High School Building Committee is not comfortable using contingency funds at this point in the project. Thank you. So uh, to summarize, we've had many discussions as a committee. Um, we reviewed all the information that uh, we have submitted to the Conservation Commission. And we recently voted unanimously to reaffirm our decision to select crumb rubber infill for the new fields at Arlington High School. 
We respectfully request an extension of the order of conditions. Um, we have shared our research into turf alternatives and appreciate the attractiveness of these alternatives. As Dr. Homan said, we have concluded that at this time, it is unwise to invest in them until they've had a longer use period. We have time in the future, uh, and the superintendent or team does, to send people to visit other schools, talk further to our athletic directors, our coaches and students, and make a good choice for our community at some point in the future. The drainage system you have approved in 2020 has been purchased and designed. If allowed, we can make an improvement to it to provide further protection to the brook. Uh, we have also shown that the conditions at the site of the new fields are not the same as those that result in the, in the creation of six PPD quinone on roadways. We appreciate the spirit of stewardship that prompted the Conservation Commission's request and hope this additional work provides the preponderance of credible evidence from a competent source necessary for an affirmative decision by the commission. We look forward to taking your questions. I think the best way to go forward is for people to, on your group, uh, Mr. Taroni, to, to make, uh, to raise their questions, and then I'll just select who in the group should answer them. Uh, yeah, hold, hold on a second. Maybe uh, I uh, just want to see if either people have questions or there might be some comments um, also. So I didn't know Susan, what you want to do at this point. So I'd like to hear from you. You want to take questions or? I I, I see that Nathaniel has his hand up. So let's get questions from the commission. And then if, if it's um, sure. agreeable to you, I'd like to put up the correspondence um, for the commission that I put up and then talk about a few technical points um, in in response. Thanks. Sure. So we'll get back to you at, at the end of that conservation commissioner's question. So Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks, Chuck. Just a, a procedural question. Are we doing a hearing or is this a working session? I think when I spoke with you last week, you mentioned that there was some some uncertainty about which this is. So uh, so this is not a hearing. We're just uh, having a discussion. There will be no vote at uh, tonight's uh, meeting. We'll continue on to our next meeting and um, that would be the hearing. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, okay, well, uh, thank you to the uh, Arlington High School Building uh, Commission for that thorough presentation and the quite thorough document that you submitted to us is, it was very helpful. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for all the work that you did to, in, to investigate the questions that the commission had. I'm intrigued and would like to know more about this proposal for the um, basket, inline basket system that you could add to the filtration uh, to the stormwater system, uh, sort of more more about how it works. I'm not quite sure how it works, and I would like to know how it would be maintained. That's my second part of that question. And the third of all, do you have, would you be able to spend contingency funding on that? Because I suspect that it would be an uh, additional cost. So yeah, I'm going to turn over to Arthur Duffy. But yeah, to answer your question, it's, it's minimal additional costs, and we would, would be able to spend about it's, Fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars. About fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars, we would be able to spend that money on this part of it. Yeah, and it would be additional protection. That's right, Nathaniel. Yeah. So Arthur Duffy's going to take the first two parts of the question. Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> if you recall the diagram that uh, Kersey put up, um, immediately outflowing from the trench drains, there are a number, um, a total of eighteen, um, split amongst the two fields of um, trench drain basins, which are basically periodic collectors of the water that flows into the trench drains. Um, they're relatively small, you know, they're about, about this big and uh, they have- Sorry, have sorry, I, oh, your sorry. screen is so small. Can you, can you use uh, this big, can you give approximate they're, dimensions? They're about, you know, they're, uh, they're, 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 they're half a meter long. Half a meter long and a uh, quarter of a meter wide. Quarter of a meter okay, wide. Okay, thank you. That's great. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, and so they're the first um, passage of the water flow from the trench drains um, heading on their way to the detention basins. Um, they have a sump, as was pointed out, and that is typically what's installed in those. That's, that's the done deal. That's the first step before it goes into the detention. Um, but the manufacturer offers an option, which is a screen basket that just drops down into the detention basin 
And uh, it's a filter, it's got small holes in it that will capture any of the larger particles that might flow. It might be crumb rubber, it might be leaves, or pine needles, anything that, that does make its way off the field into the trench drains, flows in the trench drains and um, hits this first interception, which is this, the basin. So the filter is just, it's gonna continue to let water flow, but it will capture some of the particles and the maintenance plan would just simply be, I think we um, we put that maintenance plan in the document we sent okay. you. It'd be uh, several times a year, um, just opening up those hatches, pulling out the basket, if there's anything in them, dumping them out um, and properly disposing of it, putting the basket back, putting the hatch back, and then you know, that's also a way to monitor how much is coming off the field. You you might find that very little comes off or you might find that you have got some debris in there and you take care of it at the source. Two, two points, Nathaniel, I just want to make, if you look at the memo we sent on pages 10 and, 11, 10 and 11, talk about the maintenance plan. The other thing is that when we discuss this as a committee, we, you know, our feeling, this is obviously not your, I mean, this is your jurisdiction, not ours, but we felt um, this was not a material change. We felt the screen baskets um, were within the original order of conditions. That was our feeling on, the, on our committee. Okay, thank you for that explanation. I guess it would be helpful if, um, <clears throat> since this is a, this, just a discussion, I think when you make a formal application, it'd be helpful to get a cut sheet if we could for that for that uh, screen, that basket. You know, a, more of a, I'm sure the manufacturer has a, something that you could you know, attach. You don't have to create something as good as your guys' slides are. Uh, you know, hopefully they can provide something for you on that. Yeah, that was something that came to my mind just procedurally. We might also have to consider um, an amendment to uh, amending the order of conditions to include something like that. But I'll, I'm just putting that, that up there. I don't have final thoughts on that, but I think that uh, we essentially with it, the extensions of pure extension, we can't, Change change or tweak conditions. That's technically an amendment, so we might have have that parallel path. And I think one they could do be done at the same time. Um, the other question I had has just escaped my mind, so I'll raise my hand later. But thank you very much. Sure. I uh, see David Kaplan's put his hand down. I don't know if you still wanted to speak, David. If not, I'm going to go to Brian McBride. Yeah, I, I had similar question to Nathaniel. Just interested more about the uh, the basket. So, yeah, the the more information you can provide um, at the hearing, the better. Thank you, Brian McBride. Oh yeah. Uh, so one question. <clears throat> I'm not sure this is the right time to ask this question, but I, I think you know one of the issue that's driving the review of the um, conditions is this new development with the PPD quinone being toxic to certain fish. And so in your presentation, it was stated that that's an unlikely chemical to be developed given the conditions. Uh, so I just wonder, what, what is your level of confidence in that? And would a monitoring program be appropriate to make sure that is in fact true? Uh, is that one way to skin this cat here is to watch for that particular chemical? And if, if your, uh, your data is solid, you might well be confident in accepting that kind of condition. Yeah, go ahead, Kirstie will take that. Okay. Um, so this is based on my review of literature, uh, but it looks like right now there isn't an actual approved test for uh, 6 ppd quinone in water. The EPA has tests testing out for re draft review testing conditions. Um, so, you know, yes, when that test became available, we could look into how we could access it, but we can't promise to do it right now because the testing availability doesn't actually exist. Brian, did you have a follow-up for us? Or did we get your question? Yeah, so yeah, I, I'm, I don't know if Susan has more to say on that since she's a, a person working in this field. I, I was a chemist at one time and I don't have that kind of knowledge, but I, I would ask maybe Susan will comment on that later. Okay, um, Mike Gildeskay. Mike, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'd add my uh, thanks to the committee for their thorough uh, report. Uh, regarding 6-PPD and quinone, uh, 
you suggested that, uh, or you said that uh, because the grass will be shading out the uh, infill, that there's less likelihood of PPD transforming to quinone. My experience uh, in walking across the field at Arlington Catholic is that the crumb rubber is everywhere ab above the grass as well as probably below it. So I don't know why you say that um, the crumb rubber is basically shaded and not exposed to the environment. Um, okay, Chris, you can take this. We, we can... No, it's it's one of the texts about how high the uh, yeah. we, fiber is. Well, we haven't studied the Arlington Catholic field, so this is a for the Arlington High School Building Committee. So we right. we haven't studied that field, and we really can't <clears throat> speak to anything about that field. Correct, but, uh, it's, but I'm just wondering if that's a general condition of crumb rubber infill uh, in artificial turf fields. My understanding is that we have a higher amount of fiber above the rubber. I Again, I can't speak to what Arlington Catholic has, but in the specs that we have, um, there, the rubber comes below a certain amount of the fiber. So what the conditions that you're, I mean, maybe they've overfilled their field, I don't know. I don't know either, but I was just expressing. Yeah, we, the, right, right. I'm, I'm just, this is my understanding of how we're building our field. Yeah, we can't comment on the Arlington High School field, the Arlington Catholic field. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I'll try to describe it as um, I, I don't think we're saying that it won't see any sunlight, any ultraviolet light, but it is significantly more shaded than higher grade on a highway, um, that the fibers of the fabric. You can all picture a carpet um, and fibers forming, you know, a kind of a constant shadow that as the sun moves, it's going to change um, the angle. But the materials that are at the base of the carpet, halfway down the carpet, are in more shade to light than tire grade on a highway. Uh, in addition, um, as Kirsty mentioned, there are different types of field carpet. The product that we're using has a uh, has a taller um, fiber height, and it also has some shorter fibers that will also, you know, it grips um, the crumb rubber in a tighter fashion. Um, so we believe it will have less migration off the carpet if it. Um... Additionally, as we talked about, it is um, it's got a sand filled layer in it as well, um, and over time that will that's it's set as a um, crumb rubber on top of the of the sand. Um, over time, that will start to you know traction and, and running. It will start to tamp down and sink in a little bit further. Um, so, um, and then it's also worth emphasizing that the other component to for the transformation is. Um, ozone, ox, um, NOx, um, and that's uh, equally important to create its three ingredients that would turn 6PPD into 6PPD PPD Q. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks, I just remembered my question. I noticed in the literature that uh, you guys sent that there was the literature from the manufacturer talked about plowing the field when there's snow on it. And I, don't remember what your plans were for plowing or clearing clearing the field of snow. Okay, so first of all, <clears throat> um, Dr. Jane can confirm this, but we have rarely had to clear the fields of snow in recent years. I don't think we've had to do that. Maybe, maybe can you recall? We're doing it once. Once. I think we've done it once. Been there eleven years. And so we would follow the. The, the instructions in the maintenance plan for clearing the fields, which I believe means we have to keep it an inch off the ground. What's the what's we actually had it done by our church company when we did it? We yeah. did not do it ourselves. Yeah. There we, I, we I'm sorry, I didn't hear what that response was. So the one time that I recall we did it, um, we had it done by the turf company. We did not do it ourselves. Okay, thanks. And one reason why why I raise that question is again because uh, it's, it's the other known field in, within our resource area, which is the Arlington Catholic. We did, and I don't know what technique they used to, to plow it, but when they did plow it, we ended up with, a, there was a lot of crumb rubber pushed to each side uh, um, and that did get into the brook. So that was why I was asking, but thank you. 
so uh susan before you start i just figured maybe it would be a good time for me to ask a couple questions because i thought you would might want to hear you might could address some of what i'm going to ask maybe so i was also interested in um this filter and i was i was wondering if it was more of a cartridge or something like that because i'm trying to understand if it if it would need an amended order of conditions. And so I guess the cut sheet and a little more information about that. But if if the, um, I'm just gonna call it a treatment train is in place and this is an in insert into that yes. existing train, mm -hmm. then, then I'm unsure that that wouldn't be considered maintenance. Um, so yeah, when that comes through, it would be it would be great to get a little more information about a little more comfortable about you know what you have to change out to make this work um and then i want to address some of these questions about um the crumb rubber now i'm watch a little bit of sports i uh noticed that uh, crumb rubber has been uh in the past crumb rubber has been below the carpet fiber and um but they've most teams have made a move to fill it up to the top. And the reason why they do that is because you can see exactly where that last step is before they go outside the line. And so it flips all the crumb rubber up in the air. So I'm not so much, so my understanding of how this field would work would be, it would be filled with crumb rubber. That's kind of what ends up happening. And also, and it would be filled up as much as it possibly can. Uh, the wind, rain, um, and any kind of uh, weather would also shift around all the crumb rubber. And with that, you need to maintain it. And I wanted to ask how often you are going to do that, and do you own the equipment to groom the field, or does that uh, is that some sort of contract you have and it's not done so often because without this regular maintenance we are going to find crumb rubber you know outside of the area um, that's being protected so I, I, that's that's one of the questions that uh, came up and you know my thought was if if you could just contain everything on the field inside that area including any runoff it would be a better system my last question is uh, back to the treatment train, is that an isolated system or does it accept uh, infiltration through other sources? So is Iso it combined? Yeah, do you know what I'm talking about? Is it combined with some other area also? Uh, so I think there are three points that you that you want addressed. One is what you talked about regarding the um, trench drains. We, we, we saw it the same way you did <clears throat> on the committee, but we'll get the, we'll, we'll get the drawings for you, the cut drawings for you, We'll provide more information about that about that uh, addition. That's point one. Point two: the maintenance <clears throat> plan. There's a maintenance plan attached in the appendix of the memo that we sent on March 20th, and then on pages 10 and 11 of the document, we summarize the maintenance plan. So we're going to follow the maintenance plan. Um, you know, and so that's that's what we're going to do in terms of whether we use um, some of the maintenance will be by our own staff. And some of the maintenance will be we, right now. Is, we have a contract. We have a contract. contract. Yeah, we have a contract to do that. So that'll be and the and the maintenance plan will be followed. And that obviously is something you guys, over time, and uh, when the when this comes up again for when the order of conditions comes up for renewal, you can ask for reports on how we're doing on that maintenance plan. Uh, sure. And third, go ahead. The I third was just going to ask if that uh, maintenance contract is available so we could understand the um, frequency and type of maintenance that is being contracted for. Well, we don't have a contract for this yet. We have for the existing field. Well, the contract we will get will follow this. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, we're going to have to follow the, so we don't have a contract okay. for this yet. We have a, that's, we don't have a contract for this product yet. Is that what you're asking for? Chuck? That's what I was asking for. Yeah. We don't yeah. have a product yet. And then the, the third point is for, I think, Arthur, could you just restate the third point again, Chuck? About, oh, about whether the drain is an isolated oh, the, system or if other things. Right. Yeah, the isolated system. Yeah, the answer is no. No. It's, the drain is an isolated system. It only serves the fields 
um, they drain through the shock pads into the trench drain, and then from there, the trench drain basins and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they don't get water from anywhere else, and they don't, um, yeah, it's they just go off on their own. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's upstream of um, any other um, drainage structures that also exist on the site. So there is a, it feeds into the drainage system that is also collecting other por portions of the storm drains from other portions of the site. But nothing is up, nothing is ahead of the, it's, it's doing it only the fields and then coming into this. So let me ask a different, uh, so when you, when you're, when everything's collected, prior to the elevation that it overflows in a certain storm event, is it collected with other sources in that, I'm going to call it a pond. So at some point before it overflows into Millbrook, is it getting source storm water from some other source combined with this field? No, no. Okay. No. That's all I had. Uh, uh, oh, then, see, see that yeah, another, another comment. Sorry, uh, I think we all should go back and check the existing order of conditions to see if the maintenance program is included as a special condition uh, um, or incorporated by reference that's outlined in page pages 10 and 11 of the memo. I think that's a task for the commission as well as the um, a building committee, because I guess in my mind, if we're going to, you know, you're representing that as sort of a mitigation or protective measure, and I, as a commissioner, would feel more comfortable if that's incorporated into, into an order, uh, into the order of conditions. So again, sorry to beat this drum, but it might might involve an amended order of conditions. But okay. no, no, no need to, just a thought to throw that out there for us to keep in mind. All right, so I think at the end of the meeting, it'd be great to sort of like summarize exactly what Steve and Arthur have to do to amend anything. So, uh, but yeah, we've got, uh, so thank you. Um, and Chuck, if you would just explain procedurally that the extension is on the current permit. I know we're not voting tonight, but as a procedure, could you explain that it's on the current permit and we cannot put conditions on an extension, right? right no, which so is why I'm suggesting an amendment. Yeah. I just want to make it clear yeah. to you, everybody. But as I understand it, just so, so so I understand what we're supposed to do here, you can do both at the same time, Nathaniel. That's what you said earlier. Right. Well, I, I my thought would be to have a hearing on both at the same time. I mean, technically, okay. I think what Susan is getting at, technically, we would need to vote first to amend the order of conditions to incorporate say that the bas the adding the baskets adding the maintenance uh schedule and mm -hmm. then you'd have a permit and we would extend that one because if we do it the other way around you know you just get an extension on the existing okay. existing one and then mm -hmm. i guess we could do it the other way we but. could do it the other way around but it may or may not pass no, with right. these changes i don't know i don't yeah. want to get ahead yeah. of us but i think well, they could we don't have to do the basket. We'd rather yeah. not slow the thing down. Right. Yeah. And that's why I'm trying to think of a way to do it. And I, that's why I think you could do them at the same time. You could do it at the same, same time, time but it's two time. different, right. right. It's two different votes. It's a, it's a procedural mm -hmm. nuance, but I, what I'm trying See, to do is. Which one would you vote on first? Not to, not to well, slow my understanding is you, we, there's a request for an extension. You would have to vote on that first. And then if there was something that wanted to change because all you're voting on in an extension is the existing order of conditions, all right? So that is the basis of what you'd then be voting on. After the fact, if there was something that wanted to be amended or changed, whether it needed to be or still met the original submission that the order is based on, then you would decide whether you needed to vote for an amendment or not. Right. Yes. What if some of your amendments are going to sway certain commissioners one way or another to grant you an extension? If you don't have those amendments included, then the commission may deny your extension. Then where does that leave you? So, so I'm just saying, if I was going to do this, I would put the amendment first in the same meeting. It's not going to slow things down. Request an amendment for these specific 
items and, and put those sketches in as people have asked, and we'll talk about that. But that's what I would do is ask for an amendment first and then an extension. But you can do, I mean, you're the applicant. You can do it whichever way you choose. Would, okay. Thank you. Your daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, um, just to, just a comment on that. The system as designed has met and was approved meeting all the standards required under the Conservation Commission law, uh, bylaws. The change that we're making makes will make no change to any of those calculations. It won't increase runoff. It will not change the rate of runoff. It will not change anything about the runoff. It's a wire basket that's a screen that goes in the catch basin of the trench drain to filter out any debris. It can be used to filter out, as was said, leaves, pine needles, dust. Um, the screen is about a 20 sieve screen and a 20 sieve screen would be 20 holes in the space of an inch. So it's smaller than the smallest infill material that's in the system. And it would be sized that way. It's, um, it changes nothing. Well, from a from a calculation perspective, yeah, from a right, calculation perspective, and that's what that's right. I just want to clarify, right? It would not be credited for any TSS removal, right? It's not an an accredited right. BMP or that has TSS from DEP's perspective. Nor would it change the hydrology, so the peak rates of runoff or infiltration, any of the thing of that nature, um, from the original submission would not change. Uh, that meets the performance standards that we're being held to. Yeah, I think the only thing that's not uh, captured by a, this is an insert to an existing system, but the maintenance of that insert is not included in the original order of conditions. So there's the catch. Um, so if we if we have an amendment, I believe, and you can you can tell me, Chuck, I believe that we also have the opportunity to have a discussion about conditions. So if you have an amendment and the, and the Conservation Commission decides to have a condition on, you know, snow blowing or a condition on maintenance, that's in addition to what you have. We can have that discussion and we have that opportunity to put conditions on. We cannot put conditions on an extension. Is, is Am I not correct there? So the, the one thing I would add, and again, I'm chair of board of my town, is that... Um, my understanding is when there is additional conditions put on amendments, they're only to do with what the amendment's for, right? So to do with the basket or certain things were being proposed to change, you would do to that. So exactly like what would the operation maintenance change because of something changing? It would not be opening things up on other. And again, while we're focused now talking about fields, in theory, then you'd be talking about what's going on for the BMP train elsewhere on site. So that's why my understanding and my experience is that when there's an amendment, you absolutely would put new items in the order that it would be a condition based on that amendment, but only based on that amendment, not necessarily the entire order being opened again. Yeah, right. that is true. Yeah, that is, I, I that think is that's, true. yeah, I think Susan, mm -hmm. I, I would generally agree with that. And I think Susan was getting at that as well. Yeah. David, okay. Question was like Chuck. Yeah, let's go to David. But then I wanted to make sure Susan uh, had an opportunity before this, uh, before we kill more. Um, so, David, Nathaniel had asked whether the maintenance plan was included in the original materials for the permit and uh, special conditions. I took a quick look. I didn't see the maintenance plan included there, so I think we would add that. We can do that. Okay, it's it's in the memo, but not in the order of conditions. That's oh, what they're okay. saying. The, yeah, the order of conditions. Okay, we will get we will get that uh, to you. I mean, so so I think David, Steve, Garvin will be in touch with you about details. Is that okay about what we're supposed to do? So we're clear. Yeah, I think this would happen when an amendment is filed, so that we have all the materials that would be germane to making that decision. Right, so Steve Garvin is gonna be in touch with you. Is that okay? Yes, that's perfect. Great, Great. thank you. <clears throat> All right, Susan, um, do you have, are you ready? Yes. Are you going, do you have something? Sure, so please uh, take over and um, sure. let's hear. So um, I, I really appreciate the the detail and the thought that, that went into your memo. Um, 
I do have some disagreements from the technical perspective. My background is environmental chemistry. Um, so this is kind of in my wheelhouse. Um, so I do have some, some questions and um, comments about that. So, so first of all, um, under the Conservation Commission purview, we're, as you know, um, our concern is our resource areas. And the big resource area here is Millbrook and the stormwater from an entire 80,000 square foot field or however big this field is, all that stormwater through, you know, through the stormwater system that you've, you've proposed is going into Millbrook so that we have to be concerned about chemical pollution um, into our brook because it's it's potentially going to get in there. To get at that, we we had put, as you know, very specific conditions on testing the materials that would be used for the field. Um, back in 2020, we put conditions on testing the field materials themselves. So testing the tire crumb rubber, testing the shock pad, and testing the blades, I believe. Um, we didn't put in testing the stormwater that comes off or a leachate test. That is something that we've done after the fact, we've learned over the years, and it's unfortunate we didn't put it in there, but it is what it is. We um, purposefully put in very detailed testing um, because tire crumb rubber does have hazardous chemicals. So I think it was a bit of a misrepresentation in the presentation to say that the tire crumb rubber particles have no metals and, and it sounded like they have no hazardous chemicals, they do. And that's been proven by EPA. There's many references, EPA in 2019, um, a California a study in 2022. There's many studies on tire crumb rubber showing they have hazardous chemicals, including heavy metals, including polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, endocrine disruptors, um, other substances, plasticizers, obviously, and potentially PFAS, which is the forever chemical that many people are concerned about nowadays, the chemical du jour. Um, so we put testing for all of those um, requirements in our order of conditions, which is commendable of us back then, and which obviously the, the high school will comply with before these fields go in. And those tests have to meet the regulatory requirements that we set forth um, back in 2020. Some of those um, methods, et cetera, have changed. One thing we didn't test require a test for, because we didn't know about it back then, was six PPD quinone. And we didn't put it in because it wasn't even discovered as a potential aquatic toxin until 2021 in coho salmon and 2022 in freshwater fish. So we didn't even know about it. So we couldn't put it in the permit. Um, so I'm gonna go back. So, so number one, tire crumb rubber does have contaminants that, are, that can be hazardous, but I think we've covered all of them in our testing except for six PPD quino. So let's focus in on that because we're worried about what can affect the environment. And I will just segue one minute um, because during the presentation, it was said that um, alternates to tire crumb rubber are not in the best interest of students to use alternative infills, either for playing time or health and safety. And we as a commission, that's not our purview, playing time or health and safety. Um, however, since it was brought up by the applicant, I will just say, um, and, and maybe Mike Gildeskane can, can speak on this because he's our representative to the Arlington um, mm -hmm. Turf Study Committee, that the draft report of the study committee, which is available publicly, has very clearly stated that alternatives to tire crumb rubber should be used because of their negative impacts to human health, safety, and the environment. So I'll just leave it there. I'm not going to 
go there because I'm going to talk about the environmental impacts of 6-PBD quinone. Um, but um, since it was brought up by the applicant, I wanted to make that statement on the public record. Okay, so let's go back to 6-PBD quinone. Um, I had a question, and I don't know who wants to answer this one. Um, so, so correct, 6-PBD is in tires and it turns into 6-PPD quinone with ozone and um, oxygen. So where on the tire, so, so when the tires are being used on the roadway, where does the 6-PPD quinone form? So um, thank you, Ms. Tapnick. And the, the first thing I wanna say is that um, we're not having a, a general conversation here about crumb rubber. We actually have in appendix one, in the memo we sent to you are the actual specifications for the synthetic turf infill material. So that all of the, the specifics are right in there. So it's in the appendix, it's appendix one, it's a two page document. It tells you everything that's in the product. So we should be kind of focused specifically on that, that item when we talk about product um, and what's in it and what, what is in it. So I, I, I take exception to the misrepresent, you saying that Dr. Yeah. Allison had misrepresented the what's I was in quoting the spec. So this is from the specs, okay? Right, so well, the specs are from the manufacturer, which but, we know but, are not always correct, which is why we put but, testing in our original permit. We're not disagreeing about the testing. Mm -hmm. I'm saying the reference needs to be the specs. Mm -hmm. And if you want to sue the manufacturer, go ahead. Um, but I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for misrepresentation, that's your correct. Mm -hmm. but go ahead, Dr. Allison Ampey, you want to answer? Well, there's question? there's lots of there's lots of documentation, especially from EPA 2019, their part one study and their part two study is supposed to come out this year in terms yeah. of toxicology and exposure from tire crumb rubber. But the part one study is very clear about the hazards that are in tire crumb rubber. Right. Maybe right. your maybe your spec and your manufacturer is um is guaranteeing to you that you aren't going to have these levels. But at at what levels, and that and those levels have to meet what's in your permit. And I'm trusting that that's going to be true. We'll find out with the testing, so we don't have to argue that. You know, we're okay, okay there. Yeah, okay. yeah. The decision yeah. has to be based on the actual specs and their proposal. Dr. Allison, have it has to be. It has to be based on the testing. Yeah, thank you. Dr. The testing Allison, is required before the fields go in. Yes. All right, Dr. Allison. No, no, no. I didn't have. Do you have a response? Well, there wasn't a question yet. Oh, oh yes, the question. The a... question was: the six PPD oh. turns to six PPD quinone on the tires, um, as they as your you know cars are using them. Well, where, it, where does that form? It's going to be on the outside of the tire, but also on the small particles of tire which have worn off of the tire and are now sitting on the highway. Right. And yeah, so no, I agree. I agree. But it's happening because I mean, not just because they're sitting out there in the outdoors, but because they're smog and stuff all around them. Um, additionally, there's the other stuff that these particles pick up as they're rolling around on the road um, from brake wear particles and, and other stuff, and that's contributing to the uh, differences in the heavy metals versus the rubber and film. Yes, I, I agree that tire that the that the tire um that comes off is different than the tires themselves. Um the tires themselves have six PPD quinone, as we all know. Um it's added. Um and it and the, no, six, they I, the they I'm sorry, the six PPD, no, six six PPD. PPD is added. It turns into six PPD quinone on the surface of the tire. I totally agree with that. Um what's been shown in the literature, um, I'm quoting a, a, the California uh California uh, product, um, let me read the reference, but I have it here somewhere, California product um, evaluation of 6-PPD. Um, it's formed on mainly on the sidewalls and then the tire tread, which makes total sense because you, you it, it's got to be on the outside of the tire and they call it a bloom. And that's where the 6-PPD quinone is formed. Um, tire crumb rubber is made from shredded tires, correct? It's, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So these shredded tires should already contain 6-PPD quinone. We don't know how much. 
no, but they, don't. they will well, already they contain they six pages. Small yeah. amount. But the, the thing is, they may contain a small amount, but the expectation would be that it will remain attached to them and they will stay mm -hmm. in the field. And if there's any escapes, they're going to get caught in the various drains and basins and everything. And so we don't see that it's going to be released. It, anything that's present, we don't see that it's going to be released into the brook. Okay. And that's- So you're saying it's not soluble? I'm saying in this that studies showing that filters, biofilters uh, of highway runoff have been shown to protect salmon from the negative effect, the toxic effects of the highway runoff. And because it's capturing the stuff as it goes through. That's true. So bioretention basins, which are different from what you're talking about as a filter, bioretention yep. basins, which, which have soil and things like that, and microbes um, have been shown to capture or reduce CPD quinone from getting into the environment from tire particles. That is absolutely true. It's not clear that this system does that. It is not a bioretention basin. Would you say it was? I didn't say that it was. Okay. So, so that's a concern. It, it contains a fair amount of the components of the bioretention Basin. Right, and one of the reasons yeah. bioretention basins work, right, they do have sand, they, they have soil and microbes. I mean, they're, they're bioengineering. They're not just um, inert sand and gravel systems. But it was shown, in another study, it was shown that sterilized water, river water, filtered as well as non-sterilized water. So it wasn't the microbes that are doing the filtering. Uh, I have. I would love to see that study. I have not okay. seen that one. Thank you. Um, I'd like to put up the um, the memo that I created just for um, discussion points. Could you put that up, David? And I can go through it just real quick. I won't read everything. I promise. Yes, I need a minute to pull it up. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, one of the reasons why I wrote this memo, one of the reasons was for the commission to just kind of highlight what is our role here in terms of decision-making, um, what are the regulations that we fall under when we evaluate a permit extension. And we have regulations under the bylaw as well as our wetlands regulations. Um, that tell us we have to review several things for an extension. And as we're reviewing, okay, so if you could just scroll to the highlighted point. As we're reviewing, um, the commission may deny the request, or at least I'm, I'm saying at least review these issues, where new information not available at the time the permit was issued has become available and indicates that the permit is not adequate to protect the resource area values protected by this Bible. Um, so I think it has been established that um, there may be six PPD quinone in the tire crumb rubber. We don't know how much. Six PPD quinone can be very toxic at part per trillion. It's really, really low. Um, and this is in the literature as well. Um, so even small amounts can be can have adverse impacts. If they don't cause fish kills, they can cause what, the, what that's an acute toxicity. They might cause a chronic toxicity, effects on reproduction, et cetera. A lot of this information we don't know yet. We have little bits and pieces, but we don't know. If you scroll up, I'd like to make a few more points, um, David. So that's just one of these was just the bylaw and the other was where it is in the regulations just to show um, what our regulations are. Okay, so um, we all agree that the new information of 6PPD Quino was not available at the time we permitted this project, which was in 2020. So we know that. We already talked about how it's survived. Um, there has been um, peer-reviewed scientific studies that show it's acutely toxic to certain freshwater fish. Um, and if we go... 
keep going down. Thank you. Um, this is just a history of it. when I said the PPD levels and the PPT levels. Um, it just shows you some of the levels, um, very low levels. Okay. And then, um, okay. So this is the California report that I'm, I'm quoting some of, of, of my science, scientific facts from. Um, this came out in 2022. And um, this paper states very clearly that uses of tire derived products and materials may directly lead to six PPD and six PPD quinone releases to the aquatic environment. For instance, tire derived aggregate can be used as a medium for stormwater treatment and may lead to inadvertent contamination of treated water with 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone. So if you think about that, if, if they're using, so in California, they're really trying to reuse tires. I mean, they want to recycle, you know, reuse, reuse, recycle, reduce, right? So they're trying to reuse tires and they have used them in stormwater systems. And they're saying the water going over these tires has the potential to release these chemicals. This is California DP. Tire derived materials are often used, as we know, in outdoor applications that cover large surface areas like an artificial turf field. As such, these materials are exposed to stormwater and can leach 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone. Um, this, the report specifically discusses artificial turf fields. I'll go on. A portion of the crumb rubber used in synthetic turf fields is lost over time. We know that. It goes in the trench drains or sometimes even off the fields, um, as we've seen. Um, a full-sized field um, can lose between one and a half to two and a half metric tons of crumb rubber a year. Now, you may say, well, we do better maintenance. It's going to lose less than that. But this is just an average that's that's been um, reported. Um, the lost crumb rubber can end up in aquatic systems. Um, it's it's great that you're collecting it in these filters, so maybe less of it will end up in the system, but that doesn't mean that the chemicals that are coming off it won't get in the system. The report goes on um, to include, uh, if we can go down, um, it will take, at the bottom, it will take years of testing to determine 6-PPD quinones toxicity to other species, but action on 6-PPD now may protect other aquatic organisms. And then the EPA also recognizes the importance of 6-PPD quinone ecotoxicity effects to be um, examined. Um, they've put up, recently put up a website about that um, and are continually looking at fate and transport. Um, so, so I'm concluding here, and, I, and I'll talk about the testing as well, that the used tire derived material may already contain 6-PPD quinone. It may have some opportunity for 6-PPD to convert to 6-PPD quinone when it goes off the field. And I will just say an aside that we're not talking about it. 6-PPD itself has phytotoxicity, which means that it's toxic to certain plants. Um, we're not going there right now because we're talking about 6-PPD quinone, but I just want to mention that. Um, so from my point of view, I'm very concerned about, about this huge amount of stormwater that may contain even minute amount of these chemicals, but minute amounts are hazardous. Um, now, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Christy um, Ali Amp, I'm sorry if I said your name incorrectly, um, has correctly said that there's there isn't a final method to analyze 6-PPD quinone yet. It, there's an EPA draft method, it's 1634, it just came out in January of this year. Um, it's a very rigorous method. It, it uses a liquid chromatography and a mass spectrometer attached to another mass spectrometer. It should actually be um, finalized this year. They're in the validation stage. Um, which means they send samples to different laboratories and see how rigorous the method is, it won't change much. Basically what they do with that is they tweak it a little to make sure it's more rigorous, meaning reproducible. Um, many labs right now, I, I know of other companies that are um, helping their clients um, test for 6-PPD quinone and um, 
they're using this test. Um, so uh, Susan? California. Yeah. So Susan. I'll stop right now. Am I good? You're good. Okay. Um, so I just want to try to conclude this discussion. We will be um, coming back uh, either at the next hearing or we're going to use the a couple minutes left we have here to discuss what is the next. Um, hold on, hold on. Um, what are the next steps that are needed? Uh, I'm going to allow five more minutes for comments from, but we are coming back. So uh, I, I want you to understand that also. So um, Jeff, uh, anyone from yeah, your so, team? Yeah, so I'm going to ask Dr. Allison <clears throat> So the name is Dr. Allison Abbey. I'm going to have her respond. Um, Thank you. Sorry. So first, uh, I just wanted to correct a couple things. One, you said that you were implying that all of the material which is lost is going into the drain. And I'm citing a literature review called Tire Granulate on the Loose, How Much Escapes the Turf. And it suggests that only um, it went through a 20, I don't remember how many articles, but it found that only 20 of 125 kilograms of the material is lost through surface water. Um, so that's all that would go into the drains. Um, and just as a comparison, I also looked up some articles about how much tire wear particles are produced per year um, I can get that. What is it? That one was from Tire Wear Tire Road Tire Road Wear Particles, a review of generation properties, etc. Um, it would suggest that Arlington residents generate between 135 and 250 metric tons of tire wear particles per year. Now, albeit that's not all in Arlington. I understand that's all the driving everyone's doing all around town, but that's still a lot, you know, compared to our 125 kilograms, that's a lot. Um, so that was one thing uh, I didn't, Dr. Janger had to leave before I could get him to respond, but I did ask him if our current turf field, Pierce Field, is packed to overflowing with crumb rubber, and he says no. So. I don't know what's going on with AC. I don't know what's going on with these other fields that you've seen, but our field has not been maintained and would these new fields would not be maintained. Uh, they would be maintained to the standard that we are uh, suggesting. And then, what was my final point? Uh, I'm sorry, there are so many points. Okay. Uh, I must say, yeah, okay. You, you go so I just the, okay. So <clears throat> to summarize, we we want. I, I guess we need some clarity on what it is you want us to do for the next meeting. I mean the <clears throat> the um, as I said, <clears throat> our deadline is June thirtieth. We the, the responsibility of the commission is to balance the the, the wetland the, the protection of the wetland with the needs of the project. We've outlined. The needs of the project for you. Do you have any? Are there any questions or anything you're not clear about in terms of the needs of the project at this time? Chuck, there's in sure. Could you could you just explain? I don't think the commission is required to balance the needs of the wetland resources with the needs of the project. Could Chuck? Could you elaborate on that? Well, Mass General Law says you're supposed to. So, um, uh, you know, and there's a number of court cases that say you're supposed to do that. So I just want to make sure Chuck and I had a conversation before that. He said it would be helpful to make sure everyone understands the needs of the project at this time. Anybody have any questions about where we're at in the project, our process? Anybody have any questions? No questions. Cool. So That's good. We're good. Uh, now, the next thing is clarity about our next steps, because I'm not sure what we're doing on the 18th. And I want clarity on what. Stephen Garvin is supposed to talk to David Morgan about. So we're all organized by that meeting. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's what the commission needs to talk about. Well, what are the next steps here? Um, 
And so here's, here's what I heard. I'll tell you what I heard. You want you want the cut? You want to you want to you want to cut sheet? So cut so sheet. hold on a minute, uh, Jeff. I, just um, I think we have some more internal conservation questions first. So uh, I know that we've had this discussion here tonight, and is are the commission still looking at a amendment to this order of conditions? incorporated with somehow incorporated with the an extension i think that was brought out that um this cartridge which would do some of the filtering is is going to be inserted into the existing uh system so with that i think i heard or saw that nathaniel has his hand up so is nathaniel please sure thanks um just for the record, Jeff, I'm not sure I quite agree with you what the legal standard is here, but I don't. I think we can just agree to disagree um, at this point. My my suggestion, I think, considering it further, is that I would be in favor of an amendment, as Susan sh suggested. I would be, if 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 the school committee would apply to amend the permit to add the maintenance specs, the um, filter. And maybe other things that the uh, other members of the commission heard about and want included that aren't in the existing order of conditions, I would be much more comfortable uh, extending the permit because that would address the new information that has come up since the time we um, approved the last permit, which is the six PPD and six PPDQ, which Susan uh, briefed us on, and the school committee has also discussed as well. So that's where I'm I'm coming from. So my again, my suggestion would be that the, both of those could be handled at the same hearing. It would not be uh, slowing down the project in any way. Which, uh, I, you know, I although it couldn't, resident. it couldn't be at our next meeting uh, because of the application deadline. So you, we would skip a meeting, get our facts together, get our information that we need to move forward, and then we could. Um, take this up in a hearing. And as I see it, we would amend the order of conditions and then extend the order of conditions. The scope of the amendment would be uh, what Nathaniel just mentioned, unless there's other things that the commission want to mention right now, the maintenance specs and the filter uh, inserts. Chuck, could I make another suggestion or at least throw it out there? Yep. Okay. Um, there's been precedent from DEP um, when there have been fields in the past that have been contested and then they obtained a superseding order of conditions from DEP to proceed, but proceed with conditions. One of those conditions required monitoring of the stormwater that came out of the field before it went into the resource area. So I, I would I would love the Arlington Building Committee to consider with these additions of the filter, of the maintenance, uh, consider putting in a monitoring um, well to, to monitor periodically for six PPD queen on um, using the draft method and then changing to the final method when, when it came out. I, I would like to see that as a consideration. Chuck, I think Brian has his hand up. Yes, uh, Brian, please. Yeah, just a second. That everything Susan said recently made me think that monitoring seemed like a reasonable solution. I know there are some technical challenges, and it may be, you know, best practices currently available or something along those lines. But I'd like the committee to consider that as an option that would give us all confidence that this uh, chemical is not making its way into the water. Just take okay, a second. So yeah, I was just going to take a second and ask Susan, what would be the trigger? What is the background you're looking to uh, trigger um, additional work repairs on this monitoring well? Yeah, I have to go back to my memo because I don't remember, but there's what's called a, a lethal lethal dose or lethal um, where 50% have died off. And there's a, a part per billion level for freshwater fish. So I'd like to see it under that, but I don't remember what the number is right now. So I'd have to go back and look at the papers. That okay. would be my recommendation. So the reason why they're asking 
you know, the school committee um, for it's presented that way is because the Conservation Commission cannot, uh, you know, require you to amend your uh, order of conditions, but you are kind of uh, coming down to the wire on that. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on this discussion? Chuck, um, well, um, do I have any thoughts? I just want to get clarity on our next steps. We are meeting then not on April 18th, but we're meeting on May 2nd. Is that correct? If you met on May 2nd, you'd have an application to amend the order of conditions for the uh, that would allow us to add maintenance specs, filter, and uh, install a monitoring well with some specs on that uh, for lethal, lethal dosage. When would that be due, Chuck? When would that be filed? Or David? We have a uh, meeting date, April 18th. Application deadline for the 18th is, uh, well, we passed that already. Well, we're not doing the 18th. I thought we're doing the 2nd, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, so we have uh, 4, 417 for an application deadline, 5-1. All right, I tell you what. Which one sounds like you can make it? Oh, you can come back I and I gotta reach out to David. You. Yeah, why don't I, why don't why don't we do this? We'll confer with the group. Um, either Stephen, Stephen likely will be in touch with uh, David Morgan once we figure out what we want to do here. But I just can you just summarize, Chuck, the asks, the requests of the of the group. Sure, here. I have these. People can add to them. Uh, we want a cut <laughs> sheet for the filter basket. Um, we would like a maintenance plan. If you know the product that you're buying, the company must have some sort of maintenance plan. We would also like you, and we can provide this too. But the so, so, uh, so Chuck, Chuck, the maintenance plan for the fields is is in the it's, it's in the appendix. Oh, it's in there. It's in the, it's right. in the appendix. Yeah. It's okay. Just, uh, sorry. Just, uh, Page yeah. ten and eleven. I think. But you, you want us? You want us? It's also well. Ten eleven is a summary. The actual maintenance plan is a, is an actual part of the appendix. We can attach that to the order of conditions. That's what you're saying. We can Essentially, add that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We would incorporate that into the order of conditions. Okay. So we already have a maintenance plan for the field. You want that in the order of conditions. You want a cut sheet of the of the basket. Yeah. Correct. And, th and then we'd like some deliverables for the study on uh, sand that sh uh, sand filters that filters out six ppd. Then the study on the tire. Uh, and then there's the tire road part particulates. Did I don't I didn't write the whole thing down, but did, maybe you got all those. And we have to talk about. The, I mean, the the, the okay. top two are pretty straightforward. The bottom ones we just have to talk about as a group and figure. I out think what that's what came up, and I, I it sounded like we needed that. You just oh. want the references. You just you want just the references. Want references, right? I think like you, I, I wanted, yeah. yeah, I wanted the references. If they're in the memo, that's fine. I may have missed them. I just wanted to see the that, I don't think you're in the memo. Okay. And then um and then we asked for monitoring, Chuck. Two two commissioners requested that. Uh, well, for the he wanted to so Jeff wanted to talk to David about that, but if oh. the amended order of conditions would inc include maintenance specs, the filter uh, insert, <laughs> and monitoring well. A monitoring well. But I think and, also Susan was getting at a monitoring program. Uh, there's the Wilmington School, Wilmington High School final order of conditions, which has a a monitoring program and monitoring specifications. I can send a copy of that to David, and they can provide it to the school committee, um, which would provide the framework. Again, that 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 particular monitoring program specified different. Um, what are, the, what are they called? It was Frameworks. just for heavy metals. That, that, one. Yeah, that, that was 10 different. years ago. Yeah. Right. But the yeah. same schedule about testing mm -hmm. before and then the testing frequency and the testing frequency can be reduced if the initial results show that there's not much there, blah, 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 blah. So I didn't want to recreate the wheel. I think that's what right. Daniel's what saying. saying. Let's use yeah. what, what has already been approved by DEP. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we're going to talk as a, I think right so we're right now we're scheduled for the 18th. So why don't we just talk to uh, as a group and then we'll Stephen will be in touch with David. No, I think you're scheduled for the second, right? And with your deadline being the the 17th to get materials in. David, okay. Stephen, go ahead. So okay. we've submitted an application for an extension. Okay, so That's on the 18th. for the 18th, right? We did actually time for this hearing. So we've actually made a request for an extension. Okay. Whether or not we 
have to submit for an amendment or modification, um, that would not be able to be on the 18th. Again, we, we understand and have heard the commission. We just want to technically say for the 18th, currently, we do have an application before you for an extension. Okay. okay. That's Fair great. Enough. Yeah, I guess you've heard us loud and clear that it might be in your best interest to have the handled at the same time as an amendment. Understood. So. We, we, we could understand. we could continue the 18th and then have both of those here hearings for an amendment and a continuation on the second. That's another option. Yeah, we're making this too complicated. Well, I, I want <laughs> we'll to. Ready, we we're ready to, to move on. Technically, you're going to be on the agenda for the 18th for your amendment. Uh, well, if, and for a vote as of now, and you can talk to David uh, this upcoming week if things change. Is that, do I, have I captured that, Jeff? Yeah, that's right. You've captured it. Somebody had their hand up. I think Mike did. Mike. Yeah, just Mike. A, a quick question. I know in discussing uh, 6 PPD and Quinone and all of that, we don't know a lot, but if we have a test well, how do we know when we've crossed the red line? And what do we do about it? So, so I'm proposing the um, the numbers that are in a peer reviewed paper that caused fish kills as the criteria. And in terms of monitoring frequency and what you do about it, um, Nathaniel um, had recommended a, um, a DEP requirement in Wilmington, um, which he can provide information to all of us about <laughs> um, that has those specifications on how to do it. Okay. How to do we that. don't need a we don't need a vote to move on. This is only a discussion. So with that, I'm going to close this discussion and thank you all for coming tonight and spending time with us. Uh, it was very helpful. Uh, but I would like to move on and I'm going to pick up with Scout Ben Gregory because I've seen you come on and off a few times. Ben, you have a project. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all. Ben, you have a scout project uh, at, um, let me find it, Good scout Meadows. project at Arlington Great Meadows. That's so right. Ben, please introduce yourself for the record and um, let, us, let us know about your project. Okay, I have slides to share. Do you want me to share this too? Sure. If you can do that, or I don't know how you and David set it up. David, you want to chime in? I, I can yeah, share it. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Um, okay, is that good? Nothing yet. There we go. Okay, um, so my name is Ben Gregory. I I am a 17-year-old scout from Troop 313. Um, if any of you know Troop 313, we meet at St. Camillus. Um, yeah, there's two troops. There's 306 and 303, or 313 um, in Arlington. So, oh, sorry. So, basically, I've been working with, um, like, David White, uh, Dr. Tyrone, uh, on a, a finding an eagle in Arlington, which uh, for those of you that don't know, like the Eagle Scout rank is the highest in Boy Scouts. And in order to do it, you have to lead a project. Basically. So uh, we looked at a few in Arlington Great Meadows. Um, and the one we've decided on is to, so there's, there'll be two parts. The first part will be um, just like a sign. Um, Pretty simple that will read Arlington's Great Meadows. Um, and this will be at the entrance, um, sort of near like the Emerson Gardens, um, like housing development, um, where the like old hospital used to be. And then the second part of the project will, will be to build a new kiosk, um, which right like we sort of debated where to put it, but right now I think we're leaning towards the Sheila Road entrance, which is not too far from their entrance. Um, so then here, so for the sign, this is sort of like the, the goal here on the left, what it will end up like. And then it's on the right here is where the sign will actually be located. Um, 
sort of like so there's like this fence and then it will be just past the fence um because as as to where you are entering when you enter the great motives um okay so for the kiosk this will be sort of like the model for the design this is the kiosk at the waldorf school entrance um, um and yeah so basically we basically just have copied this design just about exactly for the new kiosk that will be built so then i i, I took a few pictures we haven't discussed this too much since the the idea of putting the kiosk at Sheila Road is sort of new but these are a few locations I looked at to put a new kiosk um this is sort of the road on the left here I, I maybe like we could put it I don't know somewhere along this entrance with the stone wall or then this middle picture is sort of like deeper in the woods and then this picture on the right is also sort of along that same stone wall um and then here, here are the measurements just for the design of the current kiosk for the one near the Waldorf School that I that we will sort of like be modeling. Um, a few changes. I'm not sure how much of the wood that they used for that kiosk was pressure treated, but we'd like to use all pressure treated lumber um, for this kiosk because uh, uh, you'll see on the next slide, but there's another kiosk at the Emerson Garden entrance that fell over because the the wooden posts like decomposed basically um and so for that same reason we were sort of thinking of using six by six posts rather than what ha they have right now is four by six posts um i wasn't sure or like we weren't sure if this is like permitted but um there's a possibility using concrete to secure the posts for both the sign and the key um and then Finally, the, the the kiosk here, you can sort of see in this left picture, there's like a hinged um, covering of the actual information board. And so we're thinking that could be another potentially important feature to add. Um, here, like I said, this is the kiosk that has fallen over at the Emerson Gardens entrance. Um, and it might be hard to see, but the posts that were in the ground are sort of like rotted and that was the reason that it fell over. So that kiosk will also, like, I think the troop would be definitely interested in um, repairing that one. The, in fact, like the original plan for this Eagle Scout project okay. was to repair that one, but the, basically the people that reviewed the project in the first place said you should do more than just repair a kiosk because that used to be, um, an eagle project as well, I think. So they said, you need to do more than just repair this kiosk. Um, but that will still be a project that should be, that we'd like to do in the coming future. Um, and then finally, just some like logistics. The cost like I've calculated as of right now, it's probably even on the high end, but it's $550. And then basically in our troop for Eagle Scout projects, we generally um, basically just send out an email and do some announcements like, hey, I'm doing an Eagle Scout project. I'll, I'll be looking for fundraising from like the com the troop community, basically. So I don't, I'm not looking for fundraising from the Conservation Commission. Um, then timing. Um, I'm, I think a lot of the construction of both the sign and the kiosk will, I can like, work on at my house like elsewhere so that part shouldn't be too difficult but then there will be at least a couple of days where we'll need to be at the great meadows to put the sign kiosk in place um like dig the holes and put them in maybe it might even only be one day but there'll definitely be a day where we need to probably gather more people as well to do that so but the general time estimate hopefully like mid to late april would be when the project would be finished. And then um, just the general request from the Conservation Commission would be feedback on the proposal and then especially of the design 
um, and like what is permitted in regards to like the concrete or how the posts should be secured in the ground and then just in general permission to begin work on the actual land and yeah that's it all right uh david white would you like to uh i know you're the the sponsor for the conservation commission on this project i think it's definitely something we need um area has changed a lot over the years and it's new entrance at sheila road it's a lot of use nowadays so we need something there to direct people so i think it's a good plan good things to do if i would put the kiosk back a little bit because there's a junction there that people get confused about mm -hmm. like sheila road we can talk about the details of that but just to help direct people better there it's also not really near a resource area the kiosk. So I think concrete is not a problem, but others mm. can comment on that. Any other uh, comments from the commissioners? I, I, I Chuck, I would just say I've known Ben since he was three or four. He lives up the street from me. He's a he's a fine young man, and I'm sure he'd do a great job here. <laughs> great. Great. Any yeah, I just uh, want to say thank you, and that sounds like a very great project. So thank you, Ben, for taking this on. I think the yeah. uh, the space will be well served. I'll echo David's comment. Sure. Mike Gildas game? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Ben. This is, looks like a great project. Uh, do you have the carpentry skills to actually construct this kiosk and the sign? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be getting help from several adults one of which like my grandfather i think he'll help me a lot he's a very skilled carpenter and like i don't know he has a lot of experience with general construction stuff so. great great looks like a good good piece of work all right i oh. think it too might be easier to construct in pieces and right yeah. pieces to the site it might get heavy yeah well ben thank you this project was great i enjoyed my time walking around uh great meadows with you and your dad and uh, David White, and uh, I look forward to seeing the finished pictures when you're when you're finished. Um, There's the pictures too. Send us the pictures. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, let's. Does this get a vote? May, might as well. Uh, it sounds like. Um, we have have a, this project. Sure. Uh, second. Second. Mike Gill's game. Yep. Absolutely. Brian McBride. Full speed ahead. David Kaplan. Yes. Uh, David White. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Did I get uh, lost track? Yes. Did I get everyone? And yes, Nathan thanks, Nathaniel Stevens. Yeah. yeah. Heavy hitter. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Ben. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, we're going to move on oh, to our. Can I, can I just ask? Sure. Oh, okay. So just like really. Well, okay. So two, I was wondering if anyone like had suggestions for design changes, but also is, is concrete like usage permitted in Arlington Great Meadows? Or... There's not a resource area. Yeah. I think it would be fine to use concrete. You might want to get that dry mix stuff. And yeah. my only uh, comment, I'm, I'm curious why the why the roof section was so large. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is this isn't like drawn to proportion, but uh, over. No, no, I saw the, I saw the one on the ground uh, again. You know, I think for for shading and keeping the rain off of it. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's a window right. too. It's covered. But uh, yeah, if you come up with a new concept, you could you know you could patent it. Anyways, no other. No other uh, comments other than that. Sure. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right, Ben. Good luck. All right. So let's. Uh, we have we have uh, two certificates of compliance left. I'm going to throw both of them to David. Morgan. David Morgan offers a certificate of compliance for his 447 Spy Pond uh, Lane. And uh, if you could update the commission and, and uh, I guess that's the first thing I, I need. And then we could uh, take a vote. 
I'm actually going to pass this one to Ryan because he did the site visit. Yeah, I was looking for Ryan. I didn't see him. Sorry, Ryan. Yep, I know no, that you're out there. <laughs> go, go for it. Uh, yes. Yeah, so let me see. I've got some pictures here that I can share as well. Uh, but this was an order of conditions that was issued in uh, 2020 for construction of a single family house at 47 Spy Pond. Um, so a previous site visit had been done here that it confirmed compliance with the order of conditions. This is just kind of the overview of what the site looks like, uh, except that the property owner had since constructed a uh, chain link fence up against uh, the resource area uh, without proper approval from the Conservation Commission. Uh, and since it went all the way down to the ground, it blocked the, uh, blocked the passage of wildlife. Uh, I worked with the homeowner who cut several gaps in this fence. Uh, those are about four to six inches tall. Uh, and they're about three feet long. You can see where it's cut in there, uh, in that silt fence. Uh, and there are three sections uh, in that silt fence. That, uh, not in the silt fence, I'm sorry. The, the chain link fence that uh, show that. Uh, and then I did provide a memo to the commission uh, with that. Uh, there were several ongoing conditions. Um, five of them were related to plantings, you know, ensuring that they are properly installed with two, uh, with two years survivability, uh, making sure there were no invasives, no fertilizers used. There was, uh, well, slow release nitrogen fertilizers were permitted, uh, but no herbicides and rodenticides. Uh, there were two conditions related to ensuring that pervious surfaces remain uh, pervious surfaces as they are and aren't converted to impervious. Uh, and then there is one related to the stormwater management system on site that it is checked twice annually and an annual report is submitted to the Conservation Commission. Uh, so overall, it does appear that the, con that the project is within compliance with the order of conditions. And I do recommend that the uh, commission issue an order of conditions for this project. Susan. Thanks, Chuck. Um, and thanks, Ryan, um, for doing the follow-up site visit. I did the initial site visit, and I'm, and I'm, I'm supposing, because you did the final, that, that the issues we found had been corrected. So one of the ones that I was concerned about was there was a lot of debris in the 25-foot revegetated zone of um, Spy Pond, and that was in a very important mitigation area on site. Um, did you observe that the debris was taken out? Uh, yeah, so in this photo, you can kind of see into that area, and there's no debris in there. Uh, I'm trying to get a good photo that shows that, but it, it is clear of any sort of debris. Uh, yeah, this way can we pass the stone it. fence. Okay, it's not great. so right. great, the resolution. Right, right. Uh, no, I can see, see they took out the debris because there was there was a lot of kind of junk in there. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. That, that's all my questions. Okay. Uh, any more comments or motions from the commission? I'll make a motion to issue a certificate of compliance. A second on that? I'll second. So we have a motion and a second on issuing a certificate of compliance for 91 317. No, 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 no. 47 spy pond. Okay. That was the. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's the DP number. I'm sorry. Go, <laughs> yeah. go for it. Sorry. It's getting late. 47 Spy Pond, uh, Spy Pond Lane. Here we go. Mike killed this game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, moving right along. We have another uh, certificate of compliance that uh, is for... <laughs> 19 Sheridan Park. And I know that we were a little bit confused at our last hearing and uh, David had been sick, but I've talked to David and he's going to explain all the particulars. So hold your questions until David explains all about this project. David, 19 Sheridan Park. 19 Sheridan Park was issued back in 2011 for modifications to the residents there. The only thing that was not completed by the time that the permit had expired 
was the installation of the dry wells. They're supposed to tie in their downspouts to dry wells and that wasn't completed. So when they came to us for a certificate of compliance back in 2022, we noted that that work was incomplete. We didn't want to issue a whole new notice of intent for dry wells. Neither could we really with an open NOI or unresolved NOI, let's say, or open order of conditions for the property. So instead we chose to issue an RDA. Now, while they were considering that RDA, they thought maybe we could add a planting plan, a patio, et cetera, into the scope because they were being ambitious at the time, thinking if we're going to do an RDA, we might as well, you know, make it worth a while. And ultimately, during the hearing for the RDA, they withdrew those other pieces, and we were left with an RDA just for completion of the work that the original order had required. So that's the installation of the dry wells. Brian made a site visit same day as the other property we just discussed and found it to be in compliance. I recommend approving the order of condition, sorry, the certificate of compliance for 19 Sheridan Park. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Susan. So thanks, David, for, for clarifying. So I, I just have a few clarifying questions. So this is an order of conditions for the original permit where some of the work was completed as an RTA. It's not, it's not a certificate. I mean, it's not a, it's a certificate of compliance with the original permit where some of the original permit work was done under a subsequent RDA because the permit expired. Am I getting that right? Yes, you got it. Okay. 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 I understand. It's a little unconventional, but it, it's how we kind of maneuvered it to make make it work. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Got it. Is that is that it? That was my question. Sure. Any um, other comments or motions? Motion to issue a certificate of compliance. Need a second? No, oh, Nathaniel Stevens. All right, we have a, a, a second to issue a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 912301919 19 Sheridan Park. Uh, Mike Gillis game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. Daniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, Susan. Here we go. So we're on to the first hearing. It's a request for determination of applicability for 36 Peabody Road. Susan Chapnick, the ch vice chair of the Conservation Commission will be uh, leading the commission through this uh, application. So we did talk about it already. We've been out to the site, had a lot of discussion. Susan, I'm gonna ask you to try to keep this to about 15 minutes or less. Well, I'm going to be make it even less than that. Good. <laughs> so, um, the site. Do we have it? Do we have the applicant here to present the the yes. project, or do you want me to to talk about the project? They're, Chuck, they're here. We are. Can here. you just summarize it real real quickly? Okay. Like I said, we did this last okay. at the last yeah. meeting. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So, so this project is to repair of, of some failing walls um, due to improper installation and the fact that the um, the the uh, slope is so steep um, from the house down to the, the two spy pond. There's also an addition um, to the house that that's we talked about at the last meeting, um, which has a very minor intrusion into the outside hundred foot buffer zone and uh, adjacent upland resource area, what we call the aura, um, to spy pond. Um, so on the site visit, which we did, I forgot the date, but it was a week ago, um, at myself, Nathaniel Stevens, um, Mike Gildesgame, Brian McBride, Chuck Taroni, and um, the owners were at the site visit. And we got to see the failing walls. We got to see an example of what kind of walls they would be putting in that are actually they have on another part of the site. We got to see their terracing of this very steep hill. And frankly, I was very impressed with the with the terracing and the plantings they have um, 
uh, numerous and extensive native plantings that are really doing very, very well. Um, they like the wet weather we've been having lately. I don't know how they like the snow, um, but um, very impressed um, by the enhanced habitat um, value. Um, we were concerned at our last meeting uh, that the walls were intruding further into our resource area because they were being, um, because of, I don't know if we have the uh, the the figure that you could put up, um, David, but because they were changing the direction of where the wall was going to go. And on our site visit, I think we agreed that this was necessary due to the erosion that was happening on the site. Um, they're also moving um, one tree and removing two trees that are, uh, one of them is hazardous. Um, and proposing to plant several new trees, um, which which seems reasonable to me, in my opinion. But I guess where I'm coming from here, and maybe um, you could put the plan up. Somebody can put the plan up. But um, what we had talked about at the site visit, and and please, um, Nathaniel or or Mike or or Brian or Chuck, chime in. Mike, my, my, I'm still on the fence on whether this type of work is an RDA or an NOI. And the reason I'm a little bit on the fence is because it, it is stonework. Um, it, it's a little bit of earthwork. Uh, however, they are going to do everything by hand. Um, you really can't get machines on these slopes. Um, and put erosion controls in, as it says in the um, in the project specs. So I'd like the applicant to talk about that a little bit, but then I'd like the commission to discuss whether whether we think this is an NOI or an RDA um, to begin with, and then proceed from there. Did I miss anything, Chuck? No, that's great. Uh, so. No, it's going to take a No, uh, go ahead. You, you just threw, you just threw present, it to the applicant. Yep. Yeah. And then we can talk again. Okay. Sure. So um, you, hi. Hi. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you as well. I'm glad yeah. you all got to visit. Um, so as you stated, we are hoping to move the wall and repair the staircase um, and do it all by hand um, and hopefully able to sort of minimize that. We, you know, we're looking at putting erosion controls my now that you've seen the site where i had thought was sort of down by that rounded patio um to catch most of it and then obviously for the building site would have a separate one up top um but for the wall work uh i would actually imagine sort of where the hill gets less steep towards the bottom would be the best place for an erosion control um one of those tube hay barrier things that we had last time um, but otherwise, I think your summary is completely accurate, and I don't have much to add in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, considering what we did before, we feel like it's fairly minor, um, and now you've seen how much we did last time around, so that's that's sort of where we're coming from. Thank you. I don't know if it's helpful for the commission to have the plan back up when you're asking questions, or do you just want to ask questions? I... Yeah, go ahead, Chuck. Well, I was wondering if there are any questions. I, I, I mean, yeah. I, so I don't want to lead off by saying this, but I think this uh, this yard and this house is uh, is pretty impressive. I think that these people have taken great care uh, in the property and in the resource area, and have tried to do everything they can to um, uh, you know meet uh, the environmental standards that the commission set upon them. I don't think that they would be doing this work if the wall hadn't been shifting on them. Um, and they have an opportunity to, uh, you know, put it in one more time and have it finalized at, at that point, because they're going to, they have a, a wall in the far corner that we took a picture of. It was up on the, on the Google drive and it's, it's just a more substantial wall. And I think if they're relying on that, then it's fine. The area that it's working in is, is a slope. It's unvegetated, it's dirt. Um, nothing was growing there anyways. They're going to create a patio in that area. It will hold the hold the wall, hold the slope, and you know, with the amount of trees and shrubs and plants that they've already planted and all the care that they're taking to their lawn, I don't have a problem 
um, with this as a um, RDA and to issue a uh, determination with um, whatever conditions come up from the commission. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I would like to see a few of the pictures. I don't know if that's something that David could put up because several commissioners didn't get to go on the site visit. It's, you know, it's one thing to say it's steep and there's terracing and it's another thing to actually see it, um, which I think is helpful in commissioners making a decision personally. We were there on a very rainy, cold day. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Did you have anything to add, Mike? No, I'm just going to agree with what you said, and it is an incredibly steep slope there that I think they've done a good job stabilizing and, and actually enhancing the uh, yard. There you go. Okay, so these are some of the stairs going down, um, and you see those two trees in the back. That's where things aren't growing, that steep, steep area over there. Um, I think there are a few more pictures. That's showing you the terracing down to Spy Pond at the bottom. Um, those aren't changing on that side. This is a wall that, that they built on the other side, which is going to be an example of what they're going to redo on the wall that's failing, which was not built this way. And that's the terracing. This is up where the addition is going to go. That's it for photos. That's it? Okay. All right. Was there anything you wanted to add, Nathaniel? No, I was just going to say to move things along, I'm fine with issuing a determination. I'll make a motion. Oh, I guess we would have closed the hearing, but I'd make okay. a motion to close the hearing. Second. Is there a second, Mike. <laughs> no motion to close the hearing and a second for Mike. Any further discussion? Do we, do we need to? This is an RDA, though. We forgot to do public comment. So I'm going to go back uh, right. yeah, okay. yeah. and open public comment. Um, I know we're trying to get things moving along, but we need to do that. So um, if you're a member of the public and you have a comment on this RDA, um, could you please raise your hand physically or use your reaction button to raise your hand and we'll recognize you and unmute you. And Brian and David, if you can tell me if I missed anybody. There's a lot of people on. <laughs> No. Okay, so I'm going to close the public hearing and I'm going to ask Nathaniel to make his motion again. I'll make a motion to close the hearing on this RDA. Thank you, Nathaniel. Second. Second, Second from Mike. And any further discussion? Okay, I will take a roll call vote. David White. I think you're on mute, David. But... I muted the other man. Yeah, okay. Yes, the button didn't work. <laughs> Thank you. That's okay. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Dave Kaplan. Yes. Chuck Taroni. Yes. Mike Gildeskane. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Susan Chapnick says yes. So the um, the hearing is closed. And now can I get a motion from a commissioner um, about this RDA? I make a motion to issue the RDA. Uh, and uh, do you propose any conditions? Um, what, are you, what are you determining, Chuck? What you, and what are you determining, right? So, oh, um, I, so yes, uh, the only yes. thing I can say is Positive, like, uh, negative, yeah. Oh, so I make a motion to uh, issue the RDA for a negative three. Um, and I don't think that they need um, a lot of erosion control, but I would put some down at the, uh, where the um, additional retaining wall is going down at the bottom of the hill or along the hill, if they could do that. So maybe a 20 foot section. So the, I don't know if that was a- And have that but, reviewed by the agent prior to work. Yeah. Yeah. So we jumped, so someone has to uh, second, second my motion. Yeah, second. And, then, and then, so there's a condition. Any other conditions? I, no. don't, I don't hear any. Okay, great. So I'm going to take a, a vote on the motion to um, have a 
it's it's a positive negative determination. That's what number three is, meaning it's in the resource area, but it doesn't require an NOI. And we have one condition about erosion controls, and I'm going to take a vote on that. David White. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Dave Kaplan. Yes. Chuck Taroni. Yes. Mike Gildeskane. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Susan Chapnick says yes. So you're all set. Um, David Morgan will get you the appropriate paperwork that you need. And um, good luck. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much. Know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good Thank luck. you so much. A lot of Take great care. work over there at your house. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, so moving right along, uh, we have an amendment to the order. Oh, so we have an amendment to the order of conditions for ADA Coolidge, file number 9291 uh, to 78. And this this hearing is uh, being continued to the at the applicant's request to April 18th, 2024. Do I have a um, motion? No, so moved. Can I have a second? Second. Sorry. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Uh, Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. We are at the point where we're talking about um, the Thorndike, the Thorndike hearing. So we have the hearings. It's the Thorndike hearing. And I know that uh, David White is going to recuse himself right. from this hearing and say goodbye. And that's great. And um, let's see if I can find my some my paperwork. Oh, here it is, right here. All right. So the Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act to consider the notice of intent for con, uh, construction of Thorndike Place, a multifamily development on Dorothy Road, and Arlington. Um, uh, continued planting plan, habitat discussion, including invasive management plan. Um, and if time allows, we'll get back into the stormwater uh, discussion uh, that we started at the last hearing. I can see that everyone's here, but before we start, I'm just going to uh, uh, just have, I have just a few things to say. So um, I have a few preliminary comments and hopefully these will be uh, helpful. Uh, there's a lot of people here tonight, and I want to make sure that we have an orderly meeting. And importantly, I want to make sure that we hear from as many people as possible and everybody uh, who wants to speak can speak tonight. And I don't think that we'll be able to have everyone speak uh, in the hour that I've set aside for this uh, discussion, but we'll get to many as many people as possible. So tonight we'll be finishing up habitat and invasive management plan discussion. And if there's any time left, we'll switch over to stormwater management. I don't think there's enough time to finish that. So at the end of the discussion, I'm gonna ask the applicant to continue this hearing until April 18th. And I hope that they agree or accept that. So the way the Conservation Commission works is that we have specific and very detailed proposal from the proponent project proposal that needs to be finalized within our meeting process so we can treat it as a final plan. We hear evidence on the wetland issues concerning the proposal and in order to help um, come to the conclusion on the proposal, the commission can ask additional for additional information to help them make a decision. We operate under the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act where we are delegated local authority from the uh, Department of Environmental Protection. Um, that is, there are some things in our jurisdiction and there are some things that are not. For example, there has been a lot of comments in the record about additional groundwater sampling. Conservation Commission does not have the ability to demand action. We can only request that action as long as, it's, uh, as, long as our request is tied to the Wetlands Protection Act. If the Conservation Commission requests more information, whether it's in document form or further testing results. Um, it doesn't matter how controversial the site is, um, the commission can only make a request. What we are here to do is to protect the wetlands, the principles that are defined in the Wetlands Protection Act and that they include the wetlands, the buffer zone, 
wildlife habitat, water supply, and the 100-year flood zone. So what I want to do here tonight is the following and in the following order. It's the same as I did at the last hearing. The proponent will bring us up to date, and I will ask them how much time they need to do their presentation. And providing that's a reasonable amount of time, I will let them, I will let them continue. Then I will go over the uh, correspondence that we received since the last meeting. And then I will take questions from the commission and then we'll hear from the public. So with that. Chuck, Chuck, sorry, just one question. Is our peer reviewer with us this evening? And would we hear from- Our him? peer reviewer, I don't see him on the screen. If he's there, I see Chase. Yes, yes Chase, <laughs> Chase is here. Okay, I, I guess it would be helpful to hear, uh, and maybe after the applicant to hear from Chase. Sure. So what I thought we would do is, um, so the way this it was kind of um, unfortunate, but I think we got our uh, I got our signals crossed, and I would like to give uh, Matt Byrne and Dominic Rinaldi, uh, uh, you know, a chance to finish up their presentation on the invasive management plan and then take some questions. And then I would see Chase as uh, coming in after that point. So if that's acceptable with that, uh, could you introduce yourself, uh, Matt and Dominic and introduce your team for the record? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Matt Byrne, I'm a senior ecologist with BSC Group. Um, I am joined by Tom Groves, one of our senior botanists uh, who has prepared the Invasive Species Management Plan and um, worked on responses to the peer review that, that has been received. Um, Dominic Rinaldi, of course, is here, um, civil, civil engineer with BSC. Um, Stephanie Kiefer is the project uh, attorney, um, and I haven't looked through all the pages, but I, I, I see John Hessian uh, is is here as well. Um, and sorry if I'm. Oh, and Scott Oren and Mark Duffin. All right, thank uh, you. Are here as well. So I understand you have a uh, presentation tonight. Uh, do you know how much time you need to make that presentation? So. Uh, we had we had presented a um, a slide deck that gives a general overview of strategy for approaching invasive species management. Tom can present that. Um, he had a he had a an opportunity a couple of weeks back to uh, give a, a quick rundown of that. Uh, if you would like to see that again and 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 get a sort of a, a full full treatment of that, no problem. Tom, uh, if you could speak to how long you need to go through that slide deck. Um, I don't remember how long how long I spent through it last time, but I, I think 15 minutes would probably be fine. Sure, Great. I think it was right around 15 minutes that you spent the last time. So if that's acceptable to the commission, if people would like to hear that slide deck again, um, let me know. Nathaniel? I, I'm, I remember it from before, so I don't feel that I need it, but I'm not gonna speak for the other commission members. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I'd, I'd be okay not hearing it again as well. Okay. okay. Same. same. I'm same, fine same. with it. I mean, I might. We might have questions and then ask you to go to a specific slide and explain or sure. explain of something, and you might go to that slide because it explains it. If we have a question, but sure, I don't think we need to listen to the whole thing. Okay, well let's Great. let's do that. So and, let's let's start if, off if, with if just may, a summary. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, if if it if it pleases uh, if it pleases the commission, on on the twenty seventh of uh, March, SWCA provided a, a peer review letter that that we're that would be uh, good to talk through, um, and that was part of the record and in, in, submitted in time. Uh, to for the commission to to see that, so we could talk through the points that were brought up in that, and then uh, to Ms. Chapnick's point, um, you know, as we go, additional questions would would be great to go through with Tom. And, uh, so if that if that works for you, um, we we did 
received that letter uh, when it was posted online uh, early this week. We put together a, a formal response and submitted that today, um, understanding that, you know, the timing of that. But at least we have the opportunity to kind of talk through how how we took that um, that peer review. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good spot to to start. You posted okay. something today. I, I I agree that you should probably just at least talk that through. Uh, we had, uh, yeah. Let's just move forward with that. Um, Great. Uh, so just to make things simple, uh, that peer review that came out on the twenty seventh stated that so there were ten original comments that had to do with the planting plan and, and the invasive species management back in, in a February letter. The, the March 27th letter stated that all but one of the original 10 comments require no further discussion. So, so we're, we're squared away on comments one and three through 10. And so that's all the planting plan and, and um, so those details. The only uh, comment that uh, sort of was had substance in this report was uh, SWCA response 2-1, and that recommended that the ISNP be submitted for, for review. So that was done. And Chase, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, um, you know, I, I can sort of summarize the response in the March 27th that, letter that you've all had a chance to see. Um, the SWCA response 2-2 on page two uh, expressed some, um, you know, their, the SWCA's experience in the effective ways to manage sites similar to the proposed site project using an adaptive management approach, mechanical, manual, and chemical options appear to be presented as if only one can be chosen for each species, um, uses the example of common reed, and Japanese knotweed, benefiting from combined approaches to, to management, um, and states that there, there appears to be consistent issue throughout the ISMP of uh, misrepresenting the proposed concentrations of herbicide and not mentioning the choice of herbicide label must be followed. So just to, to take that chunk first, um, and I think I'd, I'd, I'd defer to Tom here in his experience, but I want to be very clear that the whole purpose of the, the ISMP is to be an adaptive management plan, to utilize a combined approach to invasive management that ultimately reduces the, the need for chemical controls. Um, that, is, that is the express intent of the development of that plan. Uh, if I can turn it to Tom uh, to specifically provide it, his thoughts and comments in, on that particular body of comments, I'd be great. Sure. Um, I'm Tom Grove, Senior Botanist for BSC. Um, so part of the adaptive management plan and what I've included in that ISMP um, is you know two main approaches. The first one was a chemical approach only, um, but also included this mulching option, which is a basically a suppressant for the garlic mustard that's present there. Um, so that one was you know primarily a chemical approach to invasive um, plant control. The second one um, contained a chemical, mechanical, and a chemical, and so that's combining a mechanical and a chemical approach um, dependent on species because a lot of these species that are present in this location have very specific biological treatment times um, and methods that help them, uh, you know, help the, the applicant get control over these invasive species wherever they're occurring. So Japanese knotweed is, is one that does not respond well to a mechanical approach first. And so in the timeline of that ISMP, I said that this would have to be chemically treated first before the mulching of the woodies that are present would happen. Um, and then after that mulching control, you would then do another site-wide chemical control after that. So that is actually combining those two methods together um, to reduce chemical usage on that property. Um, and the reason why 
you don't want to cut Japanese knotweed is that in the 10 years that I was doing Japanese knotweed control, um, every site that I mechanically controlled first and then chemically treated, uh, the Japanese knotweed persisted for years and years and years. Healthy plants are easier to kill. They're functioning properly, bringing herbicide down into the root system. So when you cut a plant, the hormones in the plant change and it makes it a lot harder to kill later. So in order to get control, you know, for the city of Arlington um, in, the, in this property in particular, uh, I'm giving the best management practices for this type of control based on the species that are present in this location. Uh, do you want to do you want to pause and and take you know sort of have a discussion about that or or should we look at the the second yeah let's let's see if uh if that if i hear anything anybody any questions from commissioners on that topic so i guess what we're not doing is we're not cutting uh in uh before July and we're not treating in September. We're just treating later in a whole plant. Is that what you're saying? No, um, I'm saying that, you know, in the, in the approach of, if you were gonna do that, the second option where you're doing chemical, mechanical, chemical, the knotweed has to take precedent to be treated before you go in there with a mulcher or any kind of mechanical control. And so you can mechanically knock down your woody trees that are above head height. So they're difficult to treat with herbicide when they're that big. Um, and so you wanna cut them so they do re-sprout, but you have to have enough time in between to allow those woodies to re-sprout to be functioning properly again to treat them with chemicals. So it's not like you can go in there, mechanically control them, and then two months later, treat them with herbicide and expect to have a good result. So it's it's a little complicated when you think about it. The chemical control option is a lot simpler because you can just go in there and do cut stump or foliar um, and get that to a reasonable stage of um, you know not having invasive plants there. But when you include the mechanical approach, there's a lot more moving pieces. So you have to sort of do them at specific times based on the biology of the plants um, and when the proper time is to treat for them. Plus thinking about the growing season as a whole, you know, you can only treat between uh, June 1st and when leaves drop off the plants, right? A foliar treatment, but you can do cut stump a little bit further than that into the uh, late fall and early winter. And then you have to stop that before, uh, you can't do it in the spring because the pump, the sap is running up. And so you can't really treat plants in the spring with herbicide because it won't work effectively because it's not taking it down to the root system. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Is are you concerned at all about the um, construction that's going to be proposed around this? How has this worked on other sites? Has have you um, been able to implement this plan uh, over? I guess the objections of the construction site manager. I mean, every site is different. So you know when you go out and do a habitat management plan or an invasive species management plan, you have to take into account everything there. And I, because of the construction time is a little unknown, I've built in the ability to start this at different times. So the timetable that I included in that ISMP, it's really intended for them to be able to say, okay, we're gonna start construction here. This is how the ISMP is gonna fit in with that. And so it's, you know, if they said we're going to do, we're going to start construction in uh, March, then they they could start construction. You could still get in there because they're not really going to be affecting that four acres. Um, you know, so they could get in there and do the work. And there's like the staging option of the staging of the Norway maples for the chipping later to be able to suppress the garlic mustard. Um, so there's there's some moving parts there, but the access should be fine. Um, it's pretty close to the road. There shouldn't be any like impediment with the construction going on. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Susan Chapnick. Actually, um, Chuck, I think Mike had his hand up first, so I'll just give him and then I'll go. Go ahead, Susan. So. Yeah. It's easy. Oh, all right. Um, so, so Mike, I appreciate your 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 depth of knowledge of of 
of treatment options and using mechanical as well as um, chemical. I'm concerned with glyphosate. We've been concerned with that chemical for a while. And I know we've had some discussions about using it around spy pond too, and it's ongoing because there's new science. But I, I was reading a, an NIH um, review study on glyphosate, and um, I'm just gonna quote um, what they said in it. They said, in analyzed findings, it is unequivocal that exposure to glyphosate-based herbicide um, causes neurotoxic effects in humans, rodents, fish, and invertebrates. And um, it's, there's been some new science about it. I'm very concerned about the use of that herbicide in uh, wetland resource areas. What's your what's your um, yeah? So you know a lot of that information about you know the scary the scary stuff about glyphosate comes from industrial farming, and when you think about the industrial farming complex and how they use glyphosate on GMO crops. They apply it repeatedly throughout a season, throughout a growing season, to suppress their weeds. Um, the soil chemistry, the soil itself, isn't very good on these ag sites. So you have a lot of runoff. There's not a lot of microbes in the soil, not a lot of fungi, mycelium. All of those things that help to break down and hold on to that mm -hmm. herbicide aren't present. And so in a natural system, mm -hmm. um, and all kinds of agencies use this type of treatment, especially glyphosate, because it is it is the longest herbicide that we have. It has had the most amount of research done on it. Um, and so that it is really the safest herbicide to be using in these sort of situations. It gets a, another bad rap because you can buy this, you, you can buy Roundup off the tractor supply shelf. And what that, that is, is that's really an upland herbicide mixed with a surfactant that does harm amphibians. And so what we've proposed in this ISMP is actually a wetland approved herbicide with a non-ionic surfactant. So it's not the same thing as Roundup that you buy off the shelf at the store. Um, additionally, you're in this you know, ecosystem application, you're only applying it once in a season and you're applying it in very small amounts. So you know, I recommend rates of like five to 7% for a foliar application, the 50-50 application where you have a 50% concentration, um, you're applying it directly to the surface area. There's very little overspray. It's going to stay within that root system. So the likelihood that there's going to be runoff into, and your spy pond is a little different because there's open water right there. Um, this In this situation, you don't have any open water and the wetland is pretty far away from where the treatment would actually take place. Um, so, and it is by law, you can apply this herbicide up to the water's edge. So there aren't any, you know, and then there's other on the label, there's also regulations about you can't apply it within 24 hours of a rain event. So there's a whole lot of these safety nets that are um, employed to like help this be the safest treatment to get really good control over invasive plants. And the, the alternative is, you know, these invasive plants are destroying our ecosystem worse than the, than the glyphosate, a small amount of glyphosate might. And I would guess that, you know, after doing thousands and thousands of acres of treatment with this herbicide in this area, you're probably going to use less than a quart of herbicide to actually get this under control, which is minimal considering, you know, how long it would take or how much effort or how much money it would take to do it with like a mechanical control. And you'd be doing it for decades and it wouldn't, it wouldn't ever really solve the problem. So thank you for that. I have two mm -hmm. more follow-up questions. Sure. One one is, um, are there alternatives to glyphosate that might be safer? Um, you know, many countries have banned glyphosate. I, mm -hmm. I have to look at that, you know, information. I do know that EPA, a, a lot of the, the pesticide group in EPA, a lot of their science came from the industry. Um, EPA is cleaning house now and they're getting new science. So I will just leave that there. But um, so number one, is there, is there a substitute that can be close? Um, and number two, are you proposing, I, I forgot your whole plan, so excuse me about that, but okay. are you proposing any, you said foliar, um, can you do, you know, cut and dab? 
um, and foliar not spray the whole thing. And then my third question is how long do you have to wait before we have this grand planting plan? Mm -hmm. but we're going to be doing this, this chemical. You yeah. can have the chemical there while you're planting new plants. So I have the, those three questions. Sure. Um, so your first question, um, is there something safer? Glyphosate, in my opinion, is the safest herbicide to use in these situations. This glyphosate ban that's been discussed off and on with other countries and here, California, stuff like that. The possible result of that is that if you ban glyphosate, the other chemicals that are going to get employed for that, you know, the ecological restoration activities are going to be worse than glyphosate. So things like amazapir, if you've ever looked up amazapir, it's mobile in water. And that's something that some contractors will use that mixed with glyphosate because they want to give it like an extra kick to kill the plants. And it's really bad to do that because it can flash kill oak trees and it works in the soil. So glyphosate doesn't work in the soil. And this is sort of your third question. Can you plant? And you know, for glyphosate to be active and kill a plant, you have to get it on a, the leaf surface or into an open wound on the plant. So you'd have to actually cut the stem. So the return entry interval on glyphosate is four hours. So that's when the leaves are dry. It's, you know, by the label, it's safe to enter that area and go back into it. So I could, you know, if you were doing this on a trail network, that area could be reopened within four hours after treatment. So there's also no soil activity. So even if some of this glyphosate got onto the soil, um, it won't get absorbed by the roots of the tree. So you can plant right after it, no problem. And your second question was, sorry. So, yeah, that's okay. It was it was asking if, if you could avoid air spraying. Oh, right. So um, yeah, so what I've proposed is a low volume, low pressure backpack sprayer. Now the... The knotweed, you there's stem injection techniques that you can use for that. There's also cut stump for that. And in my experience, when you do that, um, you know, you're if you've ever cut a knotweed stem, inside of those nodes is full of water. So what you're doing is putting herbicide into water and diluting it further. The concentration of a stem injection situation is usually a hundred percent concentration per the label. And what happens is if you do that type of application, you go over your allowable per acre amount very quickly. And so you can only use seven quarts of herbicide per acre. And if you do a hundred percent concentrate, you get up to that number right away. Um, also the stems have to be a certain, if you've ever seen one of those, it's like a, a hollow needle on an injection gun with a hopper on it. So like a, almost like a paintball gun and you have to, the stem has to be big enough for you to get that needle into it to actually inject it. And I haven't seen that work really well. And it's partially because those stems are so fleshy. So for the knotweed in particular, doing a low pressure backpack treatment, um, it is very targeted. You can stand certain ways. And when you're, when you're using your um, gun to treat the plants, it's mostly only on those plants. If you do get some overspray onto the leaves of some native plants in the area, it won't kill the entire plant because per the label, you have to treat the entire plant to kill it. So it may burn a leaf or two off of some other plants, but it's not going to kill those natives the same way like a high volume spray would if you like ended up having a lot of drift or something like that. Um, so what I've proposed in that ISMP is actually a really, you know, targeted approach to invasive plant control in that area. Right. And I appreciate that. And I have just one more follow-up. Sure. If if we said no spray, mm -hmm. let's say we said that, could you still do a management program that was reasonable? Maybe it would take a little longer. Um, could, could you make it work? I don't think as a, you know, ecological professional, I could, I know that that's like a want and that's a, pretty common want from people. Um, but you have to, you have to look at, you know, a situation and say, what is the real ecological best way to do this? And that's what I've included in that ISMP. And I've tried to include things like, like the mulching of the Norway maples that are already on site 
to smother um, germinating garlic mustard seeds. So that's really intended to sort of like appease, sort of meet everyone in the middle. Like we have to, we have to spray the knotweed. Um, we can do some other mechanical approaches where we're appropriate and it will be successful, but not on species like knotweed. And so, you know, you could do it, you know, I've, I've sort of included it as best I can in that situation. Thank you. That's all my questions. Sure. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's Mike Gildas game. Sorry. You will. Yeah, just a quick question, uh, Tom. Thanks for that information. Yeah. Uh, I know that controlling knotweed takes a while. And over what period of time do you expect to be able to control knotweed and basically get rid of it? Yeah, I mean, you know, as I got better at treating knotweed, when I first started, it took me like three to five years to get it to 95% control. But with the methods that I've laid out in this ISMP and you know, whatever contractor picks up this contract is going to benefit from my previous mistakes. Um, but if you treat healthy plants, so you don't sever them first, and you treat them with that 5 to 7% glyphosate mix at the right time of year, which is the most important part of this, is that biologically you have to treat them after they flower. Um, and not not we kind of forms these layers. So you kind of have an upper layer, a mid-tier, and a lower layer of leaves. And you have to sort of treat them all to get a good um, solid kill on that plant. And, you know, from years four through six, four through nine when I was doing this, I could get it in year one, after your the first treatment, I could get it to 90% control or better. And so you'd have a big stand of knotweed that all went away. And then you'd have maybe like 10 small little re-sprouts or seedlings that would come up. And there would be native plants coming back after that. So you'd have a lot of jewelweed. Jewelweed was the number one plant that I would see reappearing after a knotweed treatment. So how what does your plan call for in terms of treating knotweed for how for how what period of time does that have to happen? One year, two, three? Uh that's so depending on what happens, um I've just said that that needs to happen before any sort of mulching work happens. So all of the all of the chemical treatments could be combined into one treatment area, one treatment time of like August through October. Um and that that'll be up to the contractor when they go in there, but you know, as laid out in the ISMP, it's imperative that they do the knotweed treatment um, between August and October. They can do the other foliar treatments for the other plants or the cut stump outside of that um, between July and December, but that one is fixed into that time period. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. So you're saying basically you could get rid of most ninety-five percent of the knotweed in the first year. Yeah. And, and there's, and I've built in a follow-up. So there's follow-ups are always required um, mm -hmm. because you will have seedlings coming back because there is a invasive mm -hmm. plant um, seed bank present there and you have to have a follow-up treatment. So that may not happen the year after the initial treatment because it takes time for things to germinate and come back. So it might be monitoring is really important. So you want to be monitoring that site coming back and saying, okay, now's an appropriate time to come back and do it because that will also limit the chemical usage. Um, if you can time, you know, get, get it when the most number of plants are coming back. So you can really be efficient with your chemical use in a certain area. Thank you. You're welcome. David Kaplan. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, thank you, Tom. I appreciate the uh, the conversation. A um, sure. couple of questions, you know, to follow up with what Susan was asking about. You know, I think there's a big concern about drift and overspray when using uh, backpacks. Mm -hmm. um, I assume the stands that are going to be treated are probably fairly. There are monocultures. There's probably not much else growing around them, but I I, I wonder if you know, if there's another method like the um, just wiping the herbicide on the plant will get the coverage at the concentrations you'd need. And then also, um, you know, if if we should be considering um, some sort of no spray uh, buffers, if we're concerned about, you know, wetland impacts, maybe we, we create kind of a, a 25 foot no spray zone, 50 foot 
um, you know, or just at some point from the wetland, we allow the low foliar spray when we're less concerned about the drift. Um, yeah, so, you know, those those backpack sprayers are, you know, you can dial in how much you let out of your nozzle at any given time. The droplets also tend to be very big. So you don't have, it's not like spraying herbicide out of an airplane, you know, right. where it's where it's all air slides and it's just going, a gust of wind could pick it up and drop it somewhere else. Um, the droplets are so big that they stay within that area. Um, and you mm -hmm. have you know, when you apply it, there's a, there's a product called Finvert that's a lot heavier than water. And that's what they use for the, the method that you're describing, which is colloquially, colloquially called bloody glove. And so that's the wiping you're describing. Um, mm -hmm. You have to use that heavier substance because when you do a bloody glove treatment, if you do it with water, it'll end up dripping out all over your site, right? So that's the downside of using a drip treatment like that. And it really doesn't work on knotweed because knotweed has multi stems and the leaves, if you've ever messed around with knotweed, the leaves come off really easily. So you can't, the wiping involves some sort of force and pulling to like get that herbicide onto the plant. Um, it really works the best with Phragmites um, because it's a grass and it's, it's you know, tall and uh, just like a rod. So you can just grip it with your hand and just draw it up. Um, and that's the best way to treat Phragmites in like a, um, where you have more native plants present because they're, they would be hard to hit with a gun, but your Japanese knotweed has such a canopy that it's hard to miss knotweed hmm. when you're spraying it. So there's very low chance that you're going to get it on any other plants in the area. And it is pretty much a monoculture in there. There are some native plants, but they're they're going to be above their leaves are going to be above the treated area anyway. Um and a lot of them are getting, you know, vine covered in vines right now. So hmm. there's not a whole lot of stuff to whole lot of stuff to save there. Um but they, I mean, the applicator, when they go in there, they should know the difference between invasive and native and that saving the natives is one of those other prongs on that, you know, adaptive management plan that you want those there to help you outcompete the invasive plants once you give them the leg up. Yeah, no, thank you for that answer. Um, I also wanted to follow up on the proposal to, uh, for the mulch mm -hmm. smothering or the mulch treatment of yeah. the Norway maples. I mean, it, do it does sound like, you know, an interesting way to sort of repurpose the plant material that's going to be, you know, you're, you're going to be left with when, you know, removing the Norway maples. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just a little bit concerned that it would prohibit the growth of any other potential understory, you know, you, you know, in smothering the garlic mustard, you sort of rule out having the ability for any other um, ground cover to grow. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's not, you know, there's probably a massive seed bank of garlic mustard in there based on the number of dead seed heads that I saw. Um, mm -hmm. And you also have the soil in there. It, it's There's probably a lot of um, jumping worms, which are invasive, an invasive mm -hmm. worm as well. Um, so part of the other reason why I included that was to restore the soil a little bit. So you'd have fungi come in and more mycelium and you're sort of rebuilding the soil in those areas and over time you'd have other native seeds deposit seeds on top of that so it's really an effort to garlic mustard is one of the worst um invasives that we have and they because they seed so prolifically um and they can create monocultures and they they're alleliopathic. So they'll actually change the soil chemistry. So part of what I'm doing is trying to, you know, solve a soil problem while we're doing an invasive plant problem as well. And, you know, the native plants will still be in the area and present and be, you know, seeded in there over time. So it's a long-term, long-term project. Right. I mean, it's, it sounds like you're looking at a 20 year time frame to rebuild soil. So is there, is there like a minimum cover that we can target? So we're not just left with mounds of like three feet thick of wood chips or that it can be spread in a way where, you know, you yeah. can get the control of the garlic mustard that you need, but minimize the time it's going to prohibit the growth of anything. And it's in its stead. 
Yeah. So I think three inches would be fine. And it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we put mounds everywhere, but a, a general three inches just in the garlic mustard areas. Um, and then let the other areas come back and be able to be follow-up treated um, in okay. the future. No, thank you. That sounds good. All right. Uh, I had one question, Tom. I was just wondering how... <clears throat> How carefully you dialed in the uh, invasive management plan on drift, and if you recommended nozzle and droplet size in that document. Um, so you know the backpack sprayers, um, Birchmeyer backpacks, generally come with either a wand or a gun. Um, the wand is you know long; it's probably like thirty inches long. So that that usually goes right down to the ground. Um, the and those those guns and wands come with uh nozzle sizes already so they there's not really a lot of leeway there like they couldn't you couldn't just choose to you know like a hose say you know turn on a hose and just spray it all over the place it's not it doesn't work like that um so it's it's going to be up to the applicator to to do that when they get there um but there's there's all there's parameters on it you know you can't go out of like i said about the plane you can't aerosolize with a low pressure backpack sprayer and have it drift onto like a neighbor's property it just doesn't work like that so so that um field conditions on the day of application determines so they'll try to determine the, the the nozzle setting i guess it's a setting and the droplet size yeah so control drift Per the label, there's, you know, certain conditions that you can't treat under. So if you have wind conditions of nine miles per hour or over, you're not, you can't treat on that day. So any applicator who would be doing that would be breaking the law because the label is the law. Um, so I can't control, you know, those, that's really like fine grained. It would almost be like micromanaging to say that because the label already has all of this stuff outlined and those, the rates that they have to use, percentages, um, and then the application gear that they have to use is even outlined in the label. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Susan? Just as a point of reference for that, um, we have in the past been micromanagers um, on this commission and put conditions on spraying um, that might be a little stricter um, than than what's provided in the manufacturer's instructions. Just for FYI to everybody, we could look at that. Sure. Um, okay, so I see no more hands. Uh, I don't know if uh, Matt wants to lead us into the next topic. Yeah, in fact, it largely has been touched on. Um, the second paragraph of response 2.2 is that states that the, the ISMP should be adaptive and that sticking to a strict preset and unchangeable schedule from year to year is not in the best interest. I think as Tom has pointed out, this is very much intended to be adaptive to whenever this project starts. It, it's unknowable at this point when things would begin, uh, what windows of opportunity are going to pre present. And so the ISMP is is designed to allow a contractor to to begin I would I would say under Tom's direction um and, and coordination to make sure that the, the the plants and treatments align with the ISMP schedule and then to to Tom's point in our response things things fall into place from there based on when this project kicks off. So, so I think that second second uh, paragraph of comments we've really talked about. Um, and the final um, the final statement was that uh, SWA, SWCA recommends that the applicant either check the label or edit percentages of herbicide or revise the ISMP to specify that label rates will be followed. And I, you know, again to to reiterate Tom's point the label is the law so it goes without saying 
that a licensed applicator is going to protect their livelihood by following the law and and not do things that are off label. You know, we could we could include a statement that you know the label must be followed, but but I think it's it's really for for people that are are professionals that that goes without saying. Um, so and that was that was the the uh, and I don't again don't want to put words in in uh, Chase's mouth, but I, I, that's the the uh, extent of the comments that are outstanding. Mm -hmm. on the WCA peer review of this this project. So this might be a good time to bring Chase in to make any uh, comments. Uh, Chase, I, I don't know if you're the, Yes, you are. Do you have anything to uh, reply? To yeah, I mean, we covered a lot in the uh, last uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, and, and, and realistically, I don't know how much more I can really contribute um, to add to the conversation here. I appreciate everything that you know Matt's kind of summarized and that Tom's added and, and everybody's talked about and whatnot. Um, I, I will add that you know I, I agree with a lot of what Tom has said about you know it's it, this is a really challenging site, right? Like there's there's a lot of different species here, um, and it's pretty unique um, in, in a lot of ways that they're approaching, which is which is great. Um, if one of them's going to work, I, I would I'll, I'll just I won't say double it down, but I will confirm that you know. Knotweed is extremely difficult to control, um, and I can appreciate the intent of wanting to limit, you know, the amount of herbicides and stuff that are applied. But if there's one species that you really need herbicide to treat effectively, um, it, it's it's knotweed. Um, so I, I really don't think anything that they're proposing is out of whack or, or you know, done out of a, um, without an abundance of caution. Um, so just you know. Just wanted to confirm that you know uh, to effectively treat this site, um, you're, you're going to need to meet herbicide. Otherwise, we're, we're kind of setting the applicant up for failure because you're not going to get really good treatment to or conditions to control of invasives without that, unless it's going to go over a very long period of time. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the commissioner? I'm going to just quickly turn this over. Uh, to see if anyone attending tonight's meeting, if there are no more commissioners' questions, uh, has any comments. Seeing no hands from the commissioners. So at the bottom of the screen, we have a raise hand function. Uh, if you use that uh, reaction buttons to hit the raise hand function uh, and ask your comment, uh, we'll call on you. These questions would be for the Invasive Management Plan, AISMP. Seeing none, David, Morgan, do you see any? None. I see Lisa Friedman clapped there. I don't know. Oh, I didn't mean to clap. I meant to raise my hand. Okay, great. Sure, Lisa, please uh -huh. um, ask your question. Oh. Hi, thanks very much. I'm Lisa Fredman, 63 Mott Street. Um, I found the discussion on glyphosates interesting and extreme, oops, hold on, extremely concerning. And this is why. Um, I'm actually trained as an epidemiologist, but I don't deal with environmental epi. But there is a theory in epi that really started with drug epidemiology that um, causes, disease causes were attributed to drugs when actually it wasn't the drug that caused the disease, it was the condition that the drug treated. And I bring this up because also in epidemiology, you know, which is based on broad populations, big data, most studies start with um, case studies, case examples. That's how the Wuber study started, the WR Grace study started. That's how almost every single environmental epidemiology study started. And what concerns me is that my friend's brother recently died of ALS, and he was the first 
of what's a growing number of case series of youngish middle-aged people dying of ALS who are presumed to have had exposure to algae growth, to um, ponds. This is all in Vermont, where herbicides were used. Now we know that the mugar property is right next to the wetland. And ever since December, every single time that I've walked by Thorndike Field, there's been standing water. Use of herbicides for anything on the mugar property is going to move toward that standing water. And that's going to affect our neighbors who live on Edith Street. And it's going to po possibly affect the kids who play soccer on Thorndike Field. And I think it would really, really be important to include some epidemiologists in this discussion, even looking just at case series, because I think, and I know from you know what my friend's brother died of, that it's not the exposure to algae, it's not the exposure to the pond, it's the exposure to the herbicides that seeped into the pond and that caused algae growth. And that's what concerns me. It would just be terrible to have that sort of um, exposure in our neighborhood. Our neighborhood is under a lot of threat anyway, as you've been reading from all of the letters from all of us. We don't need herbicides on top of flooding, on top of everything else. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, Susan. Yeah, can I just respond real quick? Um, thank you, Lisa. and. Um, you know, I, I think that was very important information. I will say the Conservation Commission, though we care about human health, it's not in our purview. I would totally encourage you, however, to make those same exact statements in an email to the Arlington Board of Health. Because okay. I've said for a long time, I think the Board of Health needs to get involved in some of these decisions where, okay. where we can't really act. We're really um, looking at the impact, the aquatic environment to the, the vegetation that lives in the resource areas, et cetera. Um, but we care about human health. So, so I would encourage you to, to go that route. Okay. Thank you can, very much. Thank you. Can I, Lisa, I'd also like you to, you should look at lawn care companies in these you know, these neighborhoods that you're talking about, you can go online and look at, as a pesticide applicator, you have to report to the state how much you use of what herbicide and in what quantities at the end of each year. And so you can look at the lawn care industry and see what they're spraying in your neighborhood, um, True Green or whoever, it's going to be fungicides, um, rodenticides, herbicides, all kinds of different herbicides. And the, the ecological industry, that's what we're talking about right now, uses very few of those. And the, the amount that they're actually uses, using is in very low quantities. So not only, you know, I it's scary to think about our native areas getting sort of grouped in with these other, uh, you know, pesticide license categories because we're really trying to get something into a better place. And once you restore a habitat, you don't need herbicide anymore. The lawn care and the golf industry use these forever, perpetually, and they're not really achieving anything other than, you know, something that's not ecologically beneficial. I hear you and yeah. I appreciate that. But I also think I, I really appreciated Susan Chapnick's comments about trying to minimize and perhaps even find alternatives to the herbicides. It's our neighborhood. You know, we really need to protect everything we can. Okay. Again, thank you, Lisa and Susan and Tom. Um, I just want to acknowledge that uh, between March 21st and April 20, did I get that right? March 21st. So anyways, between the last two meetings, we received uh, 11 emails uh, and that correspondence from abutters uh, and people throughout uh, the town. And most of those uh, comments that they made had to do with groundwater testing. And so I'll just leave it at that. If you want to um, 
see those emails. We have a site set up on the conservation division page. I don't know if David is uh, awake enough to put that link into the into the chat, but uh, you could go to the Thorndike page on the conservation division page and and uh, read each one of those those emails. Are there any other comments on um, this invasive management plan, the ISMP? Is are we finished? Um, this is to the Conservation Commission. Are we finished these questions? Uh, and then at our next meeting, can we dedicate all that time to stormwater? I'm That's satisfied it. with the questions on the planting plan and the ISMP. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, so I would uh, make a, a comment that... Um, we're finished with the invasive management plan and the habitat portion of this um, application. And we'd like to focus on the stormwater management, uh, which is, you know, it's come up a lot. We've talked it over a lot, but I think we need more time to um, really get, uh, you know, a good understanding of all the questions and the answers from the proponent and um, I guess from our third party reviewer who won't be there, but, um, but uh, you know, I I do know that there are more questions. So at this point, I'm going to ask the applicant if we uh, they would accept continuing to our next meeting. Um, and, I will not be at the next meeting. Just well, uh, so <laughs> take that into consideration, please. Uh, so the next meeting is April 18th. And uh, Nathaniel Stevens says he will not be able to attend that meeting. Chuck, can I ask a question? Sure. Nathaniel, Nathaniel, have you missed any other meetings? On um, this matter, I don't believe so. No. So, okay. I can, I can so you could do the day. Mullen rule. You could watch it and do the Mullen yeah. rule. Okay. Thank you. I just didn't. I just wanted to verify that he wouldn't be. Um, he would be able to vote. So if he did that, thank you. Okay, so we've established that Nathaniel Stephen can be mullenized if he doesn't make the meeting and he doesn't seem to be. A, but Dominic, the question is, would you uh, grant the commission uh, uh, and continue to um, April 18th and for that discussion to happen or another date, if you so wish? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you, Dominic Rinaldi. Just pause for a second. Dominic Rinaldi with BSC Group. Um, so first up, um, Mr. Chair, Commission, um, so the applicant has uh, just recently authorized BSD to actually do some more uh, stormwater test pits and install a second well in the area of the large infiltration system, the, the bigger one sort of behind the townhouses in front of the, the um, multi-unit building, um, and monitor those through April and into May. Um, we are trying to set that up now, as as you know, weather uh, has, has put some contractors behind. So we are looking, hopefully not next week, but well, I mean, hopefully next week, but probably not next week, uh, more likely the following week in, in getting those test pits and that well in and starting um, monitoring that well while we continue to monitor the other ones. Um, so what we would actually like to do is continue, and I don't have it in front of me, but what is your, the the meeting after the uh, April 18th one, uh, early May. May 2nd. Yeah, May 2nd. May 2nd or 16th, those are the two May meetings. Yeah, and we would request for the second. Um, and then obviously if if things change, uh, we, could, we could push that back to the 16th, but we'd like to get on for the May 2nd so that we can have some of that data and information for you uh, by then. Sure. When that monitoring well goes in place, will you um, will you be uh, held to the same standards as before and have a uh, someone from the town um, witness these um, the wells installation? Is that I think that's what we asked for. Yeah, I mean, is that is that something the commission would like? I think so. Uh, any everyone's shaking their head. Yes, we'd like someone from the town um, to witness the monitoring wells. And David uh, David Morgan, do you have any comments on that, who we should use, or um, someone from town, or someone else? I don't think we know at this point whether we would have the same third-party reviewer out there, or if the engineering division would do it. 
and or I would be on site. But when we get a date, we could make that decision. Yeah, make that decision. What I could do then is um, I'll touch base with David probably tomorrow, um, give you some some dates. And then um, as we get a firm date, keep you uh, in in the loop as far in advance as possible. So, so you can figure out uh, who, who you'd like to have out there. Thank you. That works for me. Okay. Any other questions? Any other comments about this? Uh, the applicant's going to install some more monitoring wells and request to come back to the commission on May 2nd. Comments? I would just say I appreciate that. Um, I, I think we've, I've been an advocate and many of us have felt uncomfortable with making a decision on the data we have. So I appreciate that you're going to be doing this. Um, I do see um, a member of the public has a comment on this, so I don't know when you want to open. Sure, it. and so do I. So um, I see that Scott Horsley here, and I would like to say that I do think that everyone attending tonight's meeting uh, has breathed a collective sigh of relief with the announcement that the additional monitoring wells will go in. And uh, Scott Horsley, you have your hand up. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll be very brief too. I think this is good news. This is exactly what we've been proposing. The only suggestion so, I would Scott, can I uh, ask you to do one thing? Could you yes. uh, just uh, introduce yourself and I'm who sorry. you I'm represent sorry. for the yes. uh, record? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Scott Horsley, uh, I am working for the Arlington Land Trust, and I've submitted a couple of comment letters prior. Um, and my only comment or suggestion for your consideration would be. Um, to have the applicant or discuss with the applicant to use uh, continuous recording pressure transducers and also to get some clarity on uh, when when these wells might get in. But the first comment, maybe more importantly, because um, water levels do go up and down pretty frequently and it's easy to miss high points. Okay. Any comments from the commission? Or is this something that David will take um, up? Actually, is is that I would like to ask um, Dominic? Is that something that you can consider? I mean, I I thought those are easier to put bazometers in or whatever they're called. Um, at this point in time, uh, we are putting in. So we have the one well in within the large system. Um, it's center skewed east. Um, we would do several more test pits in that system and put another one in sort of skewed more towards the west. Um, at this point in time, it would not be uh, a continuous monitoring while the other wells aren't. Um, they're monitored on site. Uh, but is there a reason for not doing that? It seems like it would be easier because I know that you get data loggers and the data just comes in rather than having to have somebody go to the site and spend the time to do that. Is that something you can consider maybe and then and have a discussion with David Morgan about? Um, when you set this up or? I mean, I would have to talk to the applicant, but I mean, at this point, it, it, it's not, I mean, continuous monitoring isn't something that's required under the wellness protection. No, Act. no, I understand that. It's it's just a request and I thought it was a easy, you know. Sure. Uh, Dominic, do you know how many times you expect to do, um, uh, to, to go out to the site uh, over the course of that? those couple of weeks to, to check? I mean, I hope it's to do it at least weekly through the end of April and into May. Okay, so checking at least weekly. Um, that's great. And I, I know that there was a comment, so I'm just gonna ask this. Uh, is, is there an opportunity for either David Morgan or someone engineer from the town to go out there at the same time? Is that kind of coordination possible? Oh yeah, that's that. Sorry, that's I. I thought I said that at the beginning. Yes, so that's what I so, said. To reach out to David, and and as we get firm date, and then what David said is um, whether it's going to be him or some other member of the town staff or a third party uh, representative. Sure, I, I was confused. I thought that was for the initial installation, but since you're for oh, every. Oh, I'm sorry, you meant sorry, sorry. Then I'm confused. I that's what I thought you were talking about. Um. During that, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll have to I'll talk to the applicant. Yeah, so maybe when you reach out to David on Monday, we could get an answer to that also. Um, and I'm sure David would make his schedule available to whatever, whatever he could do to make that work. And 
we, of course we have our engineering engineers here in uh, Arlington also. So with that, are there any other questions from the Conservation Commission? Motion to continue, to continue. To May 2nd meeting. I have a second. Second. I wish I could say all in favor, but uh, Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. David, uh, excuse me. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, you're continued to May 2nd. I appreciate that, Dominic. And uh, Matt Burns, thank you very much, Tom. We'll see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Trace. Okay. All right, so we're done. Uh, I have nothing left on the agenda. Any commissioners have anything else to say, or I'll entertain a motion to close this motion hearing. To motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to say just raise your hand so we don't have to go through that again. And we're all good. So you're unanimous hand raising. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Chuck. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye now. Thank you. Yeah. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.